We're ready. Okay, um, good evening and welcome everyone. Um, is there a, we need to make a motion to go, is there a motion to go into open session? You just, you just have to call the meeting to order. Huh? Call the meeting Just to call order. the meeting to order. Right, I'll We're call the session. meeting to order. And good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Chelsea Whitley. I'm the president of the Amory School District Board of Education. Joining me are other members of the board, Vice President Keith Anderson, Clerk Dale Johnson, Treasurer Shar Glenna, and Director Aaron Hosking. Seated to the right is District Administrator for the School District of Amory, Sean Durfler, and Assistant Becky Schmidt. She will be recording the minutes of this meeting. Becky's not able to be with us tonight. So oh, I'm sorry. You do see have it. notes because it is recorded. Okay. <laughs> In addition, seating around the board are members of the Amory School District Amory Leadership Team. I would like to thank everyone who has worked diligently to prepare all the necessary information to consider about reopening our schools, which we'll, we'll, we will be discussing this meeting. Tonight, the board will discuss reopening of the Amory schools on September 1st. Central to this discussion are one, the results of the parent and staff survey, which was recently conducted by the district. Two, the thoughtful advice provided us through our community comments. Three, the recommendation of the district's leadership team as to how we can safely reopen our schools. To guide our discussion, a PowerPoint presentation has been created by the leadership team. There are copies of this presentation at the door to the gym. We want everyone to remain <coughs> safe. Everyone in attendance here this evening is required to wear a mask. These masks are available at the entrance to the gym if you do not have one. Please know that the board will not be taking any action items to open our schools tonight. This is a working session of the board designed for us to consider all of the guidance about school reopening. The goal of the board will be to take action on the school reopening at a regular board meeting next Monday, July 20th. There are a few guidelines which I would like to share with those of you who are attending to offer comments. Our work tonight is focused on providing our kids with school experience this fall. We are interested in your feedback about what is the best and safest way to do that. That is the topic we want to hear about from you this evening. Please reserve speeches about politics and surrounding the re, uh, about the politics surrounding the reopening of the schools are for another time and place. Such sentiments will not be productive for what we are seeking to accomplish tonight. The board cannot answer any questions or respond to your comments. We are here to listen to your thoughts about the school reopening. Please limit your comments to five minutes or less. If you wish to speak, please make sure you are signed up to do so. At this time, if there is anyone who wishes to speak to come up to the podium, please state your name at the beginning of your remarks. Thank you. I'm Josh Gould, Amory High School principal. Um, I'll first be speaking on behalf of myself and then I have a letter from a staff member who was unable to attend that I'll be reading as well. Uh, first off, I simply want to say, and I think I can speak on behalf of everybody with the school district, that um, everybody misses the kids a great deal and, and of course everybody wants school to start. Uh, there is no substitute for face-to-face -face education and we've all learned that, as has our entire country. Um, with that said, um, looking at the, the uh, parent and staff results from the survey, uh, very obvious that everybody is hoping for five days back in the building from the results. Um, with that said, uh, as the principal of this building, I would just like to point out that it is going to be very challenging to follow all of the uh, guidelines and recommendations from the CDC, public health, etc. cetera. Um, 480 plus students in here, 40 plus staff, it will be very challenging for socially distancing purposes as well. Of course, we'll do our best, but I want to make sure we're very clear on that. Um, we're not in a position to hire more teachers, therefore to have smaller class sizes, which is not an option. Um, about the only thing that we can do from the recommendations from, from my standpoint, completely and effectively, would be to wear masks. Um, that's the only guideline I see that we would really be able to follow all the time to the fullest of extent. So with that said, I would like to then read this letter um, from staff member Ramona Lockwood, who, as I said, could not be here today. 
Thank you to the board for working with our community and staff to find a safe solution for our students to return to school. As an older staff member who has been in the district for almost 30 years, I am concerned about the safety of the students and staff during this pandemic. The CDC guidelines are very clear that masks and social distancing help reduce the spread of this deadly virus. All students and staff should be required to wear masks except for the babies and toddlers in clubhouse. In addition, the students in grades 6 through 12 should have a rotation hybrid schedule so there are fewer students in the building at a time. We have invested heavily in technology over the years and now it is time for us to take advantage and utilize what we have available to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. Most 6-12 classes are 20 to 25 students and sometimes more. There is no way to social distance that many students at a time and they switch classes all day long. Both issues, the class size and the switching each block, which will mean more spread of the virus. If we can reduce the number of students in the buildings each day, it will reduce the exposure for all. Please consider implementing a system for parents and staff to request virtual learning because of underlying health conditions. These are unusual times and we need to be flexible. The other day I was chatting with my grandmother who will be 90 later this year and she told me that school was frequently shut down when she was a child. When I asked her why, she said polio outbreaks and flu outbreaks. With all of the technology and medical advances, we have forgotten that previous generations have also lived through pandemics. It's important for us to keep perspective and keep the safety of our students, staff, and community at the forefront for all decisions. Our, our county is currently listed as a high level of COVID-19 activity on the Wisconsin DHS website. Now is the time for all of us to pull together to stop the spread. Thank you, Ramona Lockwood. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tara Rose and I am a high school science teacher here at the high school. Uh, my husband and I are both here tonight. He's also a teacher. We would first like to thank the board and the school district for this opportunity to share our thoughts and comments. We are also here tonight um, to ask the district and the school board to put the health and safety of staff and students first. We know that we cannot eliminate all risks but by implementing more social distancing and requiring masks to be worn in when students and staff are in close contact with one another can improve the safety for everyone and decrease the spread of germs. As a teacher here for the last seven years, as Mr. Gold stated, we have 480 plus kids. We don't have cohorts like the lower grades. All of us staff and every student are mingling with each other and moving around the building. And I just can't see a way for us to social distance with the amount of students, the space that we have and the staff that we have. So to me, a mask is just the greatest safety precaution that we need to, our students to have. I feel we really need to lean on experts and science and the following experts advise wearing a mask and social distancing. The World Health Organization, the CDC, the Wisconsin Department of Health, Polk County Health, and even our UW school systems decided last week that statewide at any UW institution, if you're in their buildings, you must wear a mask. I also have been looking at real world applications and I found Japan. Japan has been very successful. They have less than a thousand COVID related deaths and they have 10 times more densely populated and a greater elderly population per capita than us in the United States. And they haven't been shut down this whole time. What they have had their citizens do is wear a mask. And they've seemed to be very successful and I think we should use other areas as models that we can use in our schools. On a more personal level, my husband and I are very active members of this district and we give 100% to the roles that we've been given as teachers and coaches and we do a lot of volunteering. That is only possible because of our parents. Both of our parents watch our kids probably weekly throughout the school year and all of them are high risk. So to say that my husband and I are a little anxious to come back to school and put not only ourselves but our family at risk is an understatement. We would feel much more comfortable with stronger precautions in place to protect both ourselves, our families, and our students. Lastly, I know that this is not an easy decision, and I don't think anyone in this room envies you guys on having to make this decision. No matter what you decide, we know people will probably be upset, and that is because of how political it has become. 
but in my opinion, this is not a political issue. This is a humanitarian issue. So I please ask you to think of the humans involved and their welfare. And the last thing I will say is that I hope we are trying to be proactive, because it's gonna be very hard if we don't require masks and we have an outbreak and we want to require masks a, a month or two later. The more proactive we are right now, the more likely we are to keep our kids and our staff in schools longer. And we saw last spring, the best education is when we're face to face with our students. So we are asking you to please not just recommend, but require that staff and students wear a mask. My name is Heidi Williamson, and I'm a staff here at the high school. I also have kiddos in the intermediate and middle school as well. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say echoes what Tara has said, so uh, remember hers. It's probably more eloquently said. Uh, I contemplated speaking tonight because I, I don't know that I have the right answer. Uh, this situation has been really hard to navigate and to, to deal with because it has been really politically charged. Um, we constantly are seeing shifting and conflicting data, and we know that people can use whatever data exists to support whatever side of the argument they sit on. I'm a person that likes to know what the right thing is before I do it, so this has been a hard environment for me to live in. Uh, so as I've tried to negotiate these realities in my own life, what I have resigned myself to doing is uh, following the following motto, do the least harm. And in order to determine what that was, I've asked myself, what if I'm wrong? So when we think about wearing masks, if we think about what happens if we're wrong in our decision, um, if we wear masks and we find that masks didn't actually help prevent the spread, what are we wrong? We may have looked silly, it's been uncomfortable, it's annoying to put on for sure, but if we don't require masks and we find out that it could have helped prevent the spread, what if we're wrong? We've put our staff, our students, our extended family, and our community at risk. For me, if I'm wrong, I would rather err on the side of caution and protecting people. I think there are some other things that we can look at as a district, and I'm not sure what conversations have been had at this level, so you may have already thought of these things, but requiring hallways to be one directional, so there's less face-to-face -face time, um, and as we're mingling through hallways, staggering releases so that we're not allowing 450 kids to suddenly fill the hallways at a time, but we're staggering it. Those are logistical nightmares, but they can help and they can, they can reduce uh, the exposure that we have for our students. I'm not a teacher at the high school. I work in the library, and so I never went to college for classroom management. When I was starting at the school, I got some really good advice that said, in order to control the library, you have to start out strong. Start out stern, because you can always work your way back. I think those are lessons that we need to follow. Uh, as Tara said, it's gonna be a lot harder to go that direction uh, if we start out loose and, and don't, and then later require it. So my ask of you as the board is not to find the right answer, because I don't think there is one. My hope is that you will instead consider what policies will cause the least harm if they are found to be wrong, and allow us to start off the year with strong policies and the backing of the district and the board so that we can remain strong all year long. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, my name is Carrie Satry. I'm not originally from Amory, as many of you are. My family and I moved here in 2013, but it has become our home and we love our community and we love living here. Since the fall of 2014, I've been working at the school district of Amory in the high school office. I'm blessed to work with amazing staff at the high school and the entire district. I'm even more blessed to be able to work with the incredible students that attend the high school. Working in, high, in a high school is not where I thought I would be, but I'm so glad I did because working with your students of the community, it's made it the most fulfilling job I've ever had. 
In my time at Emory High School, it has been my greatest pleasure to get to know the students, young men and women who have left a mark on me. Every day I go to work excited to see your kids, excited to hear their successes, to listen to their concerns and give them some TLC when they need it, take care of them when they don't feel well, and most importantly, keep them safe while they're at school. Who would have known that we now face one of the greatest dangers to our health and safety, the safety of our children and everyone we hold dear. We are being attacked by an invisible danger, a horrible virus that has changed every aspect of our lives. As I know, to most of us, it seems that this is far away in places like Florida, Arizona, and Texas. But one week ago, my mother-in-law, living in Minnesota, was diagnosed with it. She's doing okay, but it's been a very scary week. And she caught that from one of the kids in her daycare. So I'm here tonight to respectfully request Dr. Durfler and the Amory School Board to mandate the wearing of masks by all staff, students, and visitors to all buildings of the Amory School District as we go back to school this fall. I know wearing a mask is not a popular or comfortable choice for many, and it may be scary for some, especially younger students. But it feels so much scarier to me to go back to school this fall without the very basic protections we can all use to keep each other safe. We don't have enough room in our buildings to safely social distance during the school day, so I want us to do what we can while we are here to keep our staff, students, families, and community as a whole safe. I'm scared about going back to this fall with COVID-19 out there. Yes, I am. Do I want to go back this fall? Yes, I do. Do I want my fifth grade daughter to go back to school this fall? Also, yes. I miss our students. I miss my coworkers, and my daughter misses her friends and teachers. We need to go back, but we also need to keep our students and each other safe. I will be wearing a mask at school this fall for the protection of our staff, students, and their families. Dr. Durfler, school board members, and the entire community of Amory, please be leaders for our safety and have everyone wear masks at school this fall. Let's all take care of each other. Thank you for my time. Good evening, my name is Stacy Bosley. My husband teaches in the high school and I have children in the middle school and the high school. Thank you so much. I, it's very clear that there is an enormous amount of work that has gone into the preparations that you have um, put forward to us so far. I, I can't even begin to imagine the amount of time, effort, and, and care and thought that has gone into this. Um, I simply want to echo what you've heard um, from others. This is not about preferences, this is not about convenience, this is about care and health. Uh, the infectious disease specialists are arguing that the three W's should rule. Wear masks, wash hands, watch distance, and that of these three, the most important by far is to wear masks. This is not about perfection. We cannot achieve perfection as everyone has stated, but that doesn't preclude us from doing what we can do. Um, as one, again, infectious disease specialist said, we don't throw up our hands and stop taking our cholesterol medication because we think that, they're, that it's not going to be 100% effective against heart attacks. We take it because it reduces the risk of those um, health occurrences. So this is not about perfection, um, but it's what the, I, I, you know, to, at the, I don't want to repeat what others have said. What I want to do at this point is to note that what we teach our students is about being ethical citizens of the world who take in the knowledge and the science-based information that the teachers try to impart upon them. And this is an exact example of the kind of example we can set for them, that we're asking them to be ethical participants of this community, along with the staff and everyone else who's being asked to require masks. Uh, so in addition to the masks, the only other thing I wanted to note that I thought maybe hasn't come up so far is the potential use for any outdoor spaces. If there is any additional planning that could be done to make outdoor spaces um, at all uh, you know, useful during um, parts of the, of the seasons where that's possible, I would encourage you to think about that. I'm sure that's just one additional layer of complication to add to your plate, and I'm sorry for that, but the science suggests that would be a useful uh, approach as well. Thank you. Okay, are there any other community comments? I have one that was sent to me that I'd like to read. So I'm gonna do that at this time. And this message is from Tanya Seeger, and it reads, I have many concerns with school reopening in Amory during a pandemic. It appears that many kids under the age of 20 experience little to no symptoms of COVID-19. 
if infected without symptoms, a school setting is the ideal setup for super spreading. By hosting such an environment, the school district is putting the entire community at risk. What happens when it is the school environment that causes a community outbreak? Looking at the seasonal flu, there are several kids and teachers that get vaccinated annually. Still, every year there is always a few weeks that multiple kids are out sick. Sometimes, so bad, classes are half-sized. Now that is with a vaccine, and it's only the seasonal flu. With COVID-19, we have no vaccine and no approved treatment. Sure, many people recover from COVID-19, but research shows that most of them have lasting health complications as a result of it. Lung scarring and reduced lung function, cardiovascular issues, reduced heart function at risk of stroke, neurological issues, and now studies show brain damage, a potential risk of COVID-19 survivors. Although there is a safety plan in place for our district, that plan for in-person instruction is so far from what we are used to. How do teachers and bus drivers safely get all kids to comply with such strict guidelines? Compliance with these guidelines will likely be difficult at best. How long of lines will we have for social distancing? What about recess and other breaks? What kind of social anxiety will there be? And will the kids feel like they are locked into confinement? I am extremely concerned for all of the teachers and staff that have to monitor all of the changes in their own health and safety. Plus, we never know when there is going to be an outbreak where multiple teachers and kids must go into quarantine and virtual learning. It seems that this constant unknown is far worse for our children's social well-being than just going to all virtual learning to begin with. What I would like is that the Amory School District will continue to offer an option for virtual learning within the district to all families at all grade levels during this pandemic. I would like to see said virtual plan openly available to all families without restrictions. I've never spoken like this before, but what I'm hearing right now is a lot of fear, a lot of fear. So I'm gonna give you two numbers, 0 0.06 and 0 0.12 microns is how small COVID-19 is. Fit tested N95 masks will filter up to 0.3. Masks don't work. Oxygen deprivation includes fainting, death, headaches, heart attack, nausea, lightheadedness, dizziness, fatigue, dehydration, bloody noses. And this is not even taking into account people with depression, anxiety, and PTSD that cannot handle masks. You're gonna cause that if you put those on our kids. The other problem I have is putting them on school bus drivers who are operating heavy machinery with oxygen deprivation is a recipe for disaster with our children in the bus. 22 European countries have opened up their schools and none have had any significant outbreaks and they are also reporting that they have not had any significant factors of transmission from children. Children under one are 17 times more likely to die from the flu than COVID-19. One to four is 20 times. Five to 14 is seven times, and 15 to 24 is 1.25 times. This is statistically speaking, and these are studies that are coming out from countries, from the WHO, from the UK, the Netherlands, and Sweden. They have already opened up their schools. They're not having problems, and this is without masks. My child is in the clubhouse. He's not going to wear a mask. 
young kids are going to be messing with it more than actually wearing them. It's not a possibility for the young ones. I looked up on the CDC website this morning, young children, e.g., preschool and elementary aged may not be able to wear a cloth and face covering properly and particularly for extended periods of time. They say do not wear during exercise or strenuous activities. Intellectual and developmental disabilities, mental health conditions, and other sensory sensitivities should not be wearing masks. The other problem is if people are medically unable to wear masks, are we going to make waivers like we do with the vaccines for medical, religious, and conscientious exemptions, just like the vaccines? The other problem with the school bus driving is I just saw another article from the New York Post where a New Jersey driver crashed his vehicle from wearing a mask, and it stated a lack of O2 breathing and an excessive carbon dioxide led to the crash. It was a direct result. That's my other problem with the school bus drivers. Wear them if you want to, but I won't live in fear. The numbers state that they don't work. It does nothing to stop for transmission because COVID-19 is too small. Masks don't work, and my son will not be returning to Amory School District if you require masks for him. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dana Prindle. I'm a high school special ed teacher. I also have two kids in the district that go to school here. Um, I have no question whether or not I know you as a board will make a decision with the student's best interest at heart. Everybody is here for the kids. As a special ed teacher, I just want you to know how hard it was for our students to not be here in the building. Um, they don't get what they need virtually, and they need the consistency, some of them, of being here and seeing us. And so just when you're going to think about that, think about there are some students that very much need to be here. The other thing to, that I ask myself is, so I work in a lot of areas of special ed. There are some students that are, have significant needs that I don't know how we would physically keep a mask on them. Um, they don't understand what's going on, and, but yet they should be able to be here. So. Are there any other community comments? Hello, my name is Jeff Schmidt. Very good afternoon, I guess, or evening now. Um, parent of five, um, been in the St. Croix County, Polk County area my entire life. Thank you so much for everything you've done so far. This is really great to see, really informational. It's nice to know what the public is thinking, so thank you for doing this. Um, I guess my opinion as a parent with this is I'm okay with masks. I'm okay with those type of requirements for the kids. I don't think over time, if, it, if it's possible, that's great. And to have them do it is not a big deal. And I agree with some children or may not be able to do it, and there may be some type of waivers that you can do or something like that. Um, but I know my kids are gonna benefit from being here, being in front of a teacher, being around people, being around their friends, getting that type of education. I also seen really good things in the online learning. On some of the classes, with some of the teachers, um, Specifically, I think it was middle school science, I think it's Mr. Omens, if I remember correctly, he did a fantastic job with engaging my, my son, telling him what he needed, being a part of it, 
make it interactive, but I didn't see that across the boards. So I think we need to not just focus on what we're doing, but continuing to focus, looking long-term and building people that are doing it well and giving that to all the teachers so they know how to do that. Not just, well, we're gonna go back to school and do this, but let's do simultaneously. Let's get that online learning up to speed, up to par, up to where it needs to be where all the teachers have that, that what they need to do this. Um, I get to social distancing is probably going to be impossible. And it's going to be scary for people. It's going to be things like that. But that's my opinion as a parent. And I just wanted to express that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there, are there any other community comments? Hey, it, it sounds like that we're all in agreement that students need to go back to school, that the best education is face-to-face. -face. There's no debate about that. It's just how are we going to do that safely. So with that, I'll turn it over to um, Sean Derfler with the Warrior Bounce Back Plan. Okay. Uh, if you want to follow along, there are copies of the PowerPoint either posted on the website or there are hard copies here in-house at the tables by the doors in the, uh, I guess, the entrance to the gym. The, um, this journey that we're on in regards to preparation for the fall is not in any way, shape, or form something we just began. It is something that we have begun talking about as far back as the late spring. We were, our eyes were on getting the school year wrapped up, and then our eyes were on how do we get ready for the fall? So you'll see, I, I don't need to read to you all of the, the meetings that we've had, but we've had quite a few with the district team, the administrative team, which is in essence the principals, director of people services, and myself, and also as a county, the Polk County School Districts, of which there are nine, have been meeting a couple of times here over the course of the summer, and we meet again in a, in a week and a half. Uh, in tandem with the various meetings that we've had, we sought to get feedback from the community and from staff. And you'll see there, and I apologize if your eyesight is um, not the best, and, and mine is not when you get down to this size of font, but for the, uh, for the ease of copying all of this, which took quite some time, we put two, two slides per page. So. If you want to see a clearer version, you might want to go online, but it's all here. So the parent survey results, we had 550 respondents, and this could be parents of multi, uh, uh, from the same household. We simply didn't track it that way. We had 557 people answer the questions is, is in essence what I'll say. It was equally representative, if you see just looking at the pieces of the pie on the page, from each of the four buildings in the district. So we heard from all parents of all four buildings. Uh, the heavy preponderance was with families that had one or two kids. There were a few that had four and five, and their comments articulated how daunting the task was to educate four or five kids at home. I can only imagine how hard that was. Okay, I've got to click through that. I've got to follow directions. Okay, there it is. The next page, you'll see the results of parent survey question number three what resources do you believe are of the greatest help to you the uh, resources that were deemed to be of the greatest help were teacher instruction and teacher follow-up followed by virtual meetings whether that be google hangout or zoom uh, those opportunities and then followed shortly after that the instructional materials that were sent home Please remember that from the moment from which we were in school to the moment we went fully remote was the matter of 48 to 72 hours. So there really wasn't a whole lot of time to game plan. It happened awfully fast, as you know. So that was the, answer, the answers to question number three. Question number four, in what ways did you provide support to your children during remote learning? The most often given answer was that they encouraged their student and they discussed how school was going. And certainly within the comments, the, the anecdotal information provided by parents, it was a daunting task to get home from your work day at five and then to educate your kids when you were at work all day and they weren't receiving an education during the day. It's a matter of having to balance life and it was a very difficult proposition. That's very safe to say. 
Question number six. How do you feel about your children returning to school in the fall? Uh, there again were 557 responses. The blue section was 321 folks saying that they were certain that kids would be coming back in the fall and then uh, I am likely to send kids back in the fall. That was 179 by my quick math, being a former social studies teacher, that's not always easy, was 500 of the 557 said that we're coming back in the fall. Then there were 57 folks that said we're, we're in essence hesitant to do that or we're just not going to do that. The seventh question, which model is the best fit for you, for your kids for the fall? There were 348 of the 557 stated 100% in-person instruction. And then the second category is what's in essence referred to as the hybrid, some here, some not here. And then lastly, 100% remote, which was in essence the experience of March, April, May. Question number eight, I would feel safer for my children to attend school if, and you could check all that applied, the most frequently given answer was social distancing is in place. That was the red, and that was 194 of the 557, followed by the district makes personal protective equipment available. That was 173 folks stated that. And the lowest ranking uh, was that the school operates remotely. Uh, in that mass, have been talked about here quite a bit already. I'll make note here of the 557 in regards to response, 137 folks indicated that they wanted that to be part of the landscape. The ninth and 10th questions, uh, it simply reads what the question was. There were 557 written responses that went with 557 fill in the bubbles. And I can uh, share with you Question number nine, which states, please provide any additional feedback you have regarding remote instruction for your children during the extended closure. The single highest rated, if you will, response to that question of the 557, there were probably 400 people that said, my internet really was slow. It was hard, I couldn't get connected. It got so slow, I couldn't use it. It was very difficult. We're gonna talk about that in the presentation. That was the single biggest roadblock other than having enough time in the day to manage life that was articulated by our parents. The, question, the, the last question, question number 10, please provide any feedback you have about returning to school. The two big themes there, first, we want kids back in school. Everyone here, I, I imagine, could agree with that. And we want them back in the version of a five-day school week, not a hybrid model of two or three or four, a five-day school week and the sentiments uh, ran very clearly towards, I want them back in school and I want them in a five-day school week, but I do not want them wearing masks. That was stated a lot. I don't know exact percentage, but quite a few times. Any feedback from the board in regards to the questions? I sort of ran through those and you could certainly see them in front of you and I'll turn it over to you if there's any feedback that you may have. I appreciated having the survey sent out. I appreciated how many people participated in the survey. Um, I think that gives us a really good idea of what the community thinks, what the community wants, and um, ultimately that's our, our job here as a, as a board is to um, make decisions based on what the community's interests are. I thought it was a daunting number at first. <laughs> I sat down and started reading them. I read through them all. It's very compelling to hear the different spectrum of, of issues that people had and the concerns they had. And so that's an eye opening that there were things that I didn't think about. And then there's things that brought more thought out. So I think that uh, the survey was great. And it's going to be a good discussion for us to, to find out what, what is going to work best. It was a good tool. Sean, on, on number 10 there, you had made the comment. Can you just repeat your, your response there? I think you said, uh, our parents said, we want the students back in school, but a number of them said without masks? Correct. The, the, the trends were five days school week, uh, not a hybrid model of instruction where people are having kids home and at school, depending on the day and so forth. And the other big theme was, but not having kids wear masks. That was stated quite often in the comments. 
again, I don't have a percentage exactly how many, but probably a quarter to a third stated that. The staff survey, well, first of all, let me say that thank you very much for those who took the time to fill the survey out. Your feedback is instrumental in making the right decisions here. You are, after all, who we're talking about, you and your kids. We can't do this in isolation. So thank you very much to the folks that took the time to do that. The staff survey results, we had 155, 154 respondents. We had a, um, about two-thirds or so were certified staff. Uh, the remaining third was support staff, and then there were a few administrative types in the mix. All four, all five, if you count the district office, uh, were heard from, if you will. So we, we heard from each of the, the, the buildings because the concerns are different based on building. Uh, the questions that were asked, the third question, from your experiences this past spring, what worked well to engage kids? Well, when you say what worked well, it's sort of a loaded question because nothing worked as well as you actually being there with them and them being with you. There's nothing that supplants that. The ability to connect to them by providing materials was deemed as very helpful and also connecting to them virtually via Zoom meetings or Google Hangouts where it was deemed as semi-helpful because it's tough to engage with 16 second graders on technology. That would be a, a tough deal for anybody to do. So those were themes there. As an educator, what was your biggest challenge? The same challenge that the parents uh, articulated was a challenge from staff. I can't connect to my kid in my class because they don't have the ability technologically to do it. They couldn't get on, they couldn't run the program that I wanted them to run on the computer. So that was very difficult for them. The technological roadblocks. What additional training? Uh, there's all sorts of additional trainings that are popping up all over the place in regards to virtual instruction. Being a better virtual instructor, that was deemed as a roadblock, because very few had done this before. I would say probably 95% hadn't done this before. So they're looking for more help there in case this ever becomes an inevitability again. And the last question, what concerns do you have about school resuming in the fall? Uh, the, con the concerns are, safety. And those concerns were articulated here this evening, I think pretty clearly, that folks are worried about the pandemic that is in our midst and they're worried about their safety because they obviously during a given day, whether they have a third grade class or a group of sophomores, they're gonna see a variety of kids throughout the day. And I'm here to tell you, social distancing in a school is a tough, tough proposition where unless we start taking out walls and so forth, it's a hard deal. So those were, Oh, a few more items, sorry. Staff person, I would feel safer if the following measures were implemented. Uh, the most often stated was social distancing. So staff would like it to occur, but I think staff are also realistic in knowing that that's tough to do. I met with a group of certified staff last week and that was a pretty common theme. That's tough to do where I'm at in my classroom in my building. Which model would best beat the needs? Um, the Greatest number of responses was 100% in person, then followed by a combination, sort of a hybrid of here and there. And then one individual noted that a remote instructional experience would be best. The last two questions, please provide feedback about remote instruction. They want to be better instructors remotely if they need to do that. So that's that professional development piece. And then lastly, please provide any feedback you have regarding the return of students Everyone wants to be back. Staff said it over and over and over and over. We want to be back. We want our kids back. We want to be back. But we're worried about our safety. That was stated probably in at least a quarter of the cases in the comments. So those, I believe, that is the end of the line for the results of the staff survey. So if you have any feedback on that, certainly would, this would be the time. I want to thank the staff for taking the time to fill that out um, and to share their feelings with the board. Um, I thank the staff who spoke tonight in community comment um, to make sure that those sentiments were heard. Um, I think that their sentiments echo all of our sentiments of 
getting our kids back in our classrooms because we really do have top-notch teachers here and there's just no substitute for those teachers that we have here in face-to-face. -face. Um, it's a concern for all of us. How do we go about doing that safely for our staff, safely for our students, safely for our community, and all students? Um, as was mentioned already, there's barriers to that. There, there's logistics to that. Um, I'm hoping we can have a good conversation about those things tonight, but um, from what the staff says, it's resounding too that they're eager to get back to school too with reservations, and I think the board hears those reservations loud and clear too. It's, it's a tough, tough decision. After reading through all this, both uh, community and staff and that, the one thing I, I ultimately came up with was is we can do this. The loose cannon on the deck is what's happening out there you know and so we got to have our community our parents and our staff all being responsible so that you know when those kids come back if they're wearing masks or not or how they are that what they're doing outside of school is is in a responsible manner not to you know infect or you know risk what we have inside the school because we can do the best thing here, but when it comes in from outside, that's our risk that I, I look at and say, but I think Amory is superior in that fact. They know, and the parents know that we need to make sure that all our kids and staff stay safe. And so that's what I'm hoping, but I, I, I guess I, I, I know we can do it. We just need the help of everybody, excuse me. Okay, the, uh, the slides that you, hear, that you will hear about coming up, this is from the Education Forward document from the Department of Public Instruction. This was not my creation or the district's creation by any means. Simply want to sort of the chart the landscape of where we're presently at, and then we'll get into the essence of what we're proposing here as a district. So without any further ado, I'm gonna run through that. The goals of us returning to school, and I'm not gonna read slides to you, you have it in front of you, I will paraphrase. We wanna keep students physically safe. We wanna make sure their social and emotional needs are met. They've been away for, if you get to the fall, a better part of six months, that's a tough proposition for kids. Uh, keep, keep learning coherent, as in we lost some time here over the course of the last part of the school year and um, in through the summer. Meeting the needs of every student, that's, that's tough to do when you have a distance learning proposition. Uh, designing flexibil flexibility into school schedules, built in environments such as portable classrooms, protocols, so to do things differently than you, than you were before. I'm, I'm here to tell you it's not gonna look the same as it did at the beginning of March, it's, it's gonna look different, it has to look different if we're gonna respond in kind. So those are the goals that we have set before us. The public health assumptions around, around this is certainly is a moving target, as you know. Virus remains in circulation. When schools reopen, we're gonna have to come up with ways to, to screen students and staff for symptoms, to socially distance, to isolate, and to timely remove students who are not well, displaying symptoms. There are deaths from COVID-19, uh, and there are a, a, a greater preponderance of deaths with children or family members who are high, ri high risk already, as in have a pre-existing condition, we have to entertain that. There are homes where there are folks that have issues with pre-existing conditions. Uh, the fear and loss and isolation may result. Increased mental health supports are gonna be needed. And lastly, we have to communicate with all of you. And hopefully we have done that thus far and we're gonna continue to do that because you need to hear what we're doing. Student equity, this, this situation has created some inequitable experiences for our families. Some folks have internet that was spot on and great and worked and wasn't an issue and others didn't have internet at all. Some folks are able to work from home and some folks aren't able to work from home. Some folks have kids that have specific needs that instructors need to address and some folks didn't have that. So there were all sorts of inequities that existed and we need to attend to those with whatever plan we create when they return in the fall. So that's in essence what, what this slide uh, imparts. The learning landscape, uh, we need to monitor the guidance affecting 
our communities. Uh, there is the in-person version of instruction, a physically distanced version where you're in larger environments such as outdoor classrooms or at other settings altogether, and then the virtual opportunities. There will be new health and safety protocols that will exist that we'll have to learn about and implement potentially. And lastly, the current data suggests that this is going to be a dis disproportionate burden of illness and death among a racial and ethnic minority groups. So we have to keep our eye on that. In addition, we have to provide a positive educational and social interaction. We have always sought to do that in the school district of Amory and nothing has changed on that front. And we need to keep an eye on those who are in high risk categories. We have staff that are over the age of 60. Uh, we have staff with underlying medical conditions and we have students who live with those family members. So we have to be attendant to that. Our district leadership team, and you see uh, most of those folks here this evening, we've been spending quite a bit of time on this. Uh, so those are the folks in the particular areas and you'll hear from some of them this evening. I'm not gonna be the arbiter of all information. If there's a subject that comes up that someone can speak to better than me, we're gonna have them at the mic and the board can hear from them. The Polk County District Administrators and the Polk County Health Department have met twice and then we're meeting a third time here in about a week and a half. Uh, all of the districts in Polk County are, are at this point in time as of a call I had today with all of them on the same page with what their recommendations are going to be. In nearly every case, they're recommending a five day school week. In nearly every single case, they're recommending that staff are required to wear a mask. In nearly every single case, they are not requiring students to wear a mask. That's nine for nine in, in this county. And we've had that conversation because the group that we work with is Polk County Health. Now I know that logically we spent a lot of time in the Middle Border Conference, but six of those eight schools, Somerset and Ellsworth and Prescott, they're not in Polk County. So we're not having conversation with them as much right now, though that will be an athletics conversation we're gonna to have to have. So we've had a lot of conversation within the county. They have board meetings that are coming up over the course of the next two weeks, just like we have here. There is the in-person version of learning. That is our recommendation. The district leadership team is recommending that Amory schools open September 1st as an in-person learning experience. 93% of parent respondents wanted a full-time or at least part-time experience where they were in person and 80% of staff said that. So I think it's a pretty safe um, assumption to say that people wanna be back in school. There are a lot of other options. Here are four different options on this page. There's a four-day week, a two-day week rotation and AB schedule, and an elementary in-person secondary virtual schedule. Now, I'm going to stop talking for a moment, and I want folks to be able to chime in here on the board if you have thoughts about something different than a five-day school week, because there are lots of other things that other districts are intending, perhaps going to implement here in the fall. So I don't want to shortchange those other options. So I'll turn it over to you if you have any thoughts. Um, <clears throat> obviously, here the recommendation is to, to go back to school five days a week um, as usual. And um, so we have had people say that they are not comfortable with that. And so is there an option on the table for those people who are not comfortable to come back to school to uh, do that virtually? Sure, the fallback position and then the fallback position number two for the district is as follows. So we're recommending a five day school week where students are in person for their instruction. The fallback position, if we had an outbreak or something in this community, we would look at doing a three or a four or an A, B or something of that sort. We're working on those details at our uh, summer retreat as an administrative team. And we're going to uh, have that plan in place because this could happen at any moment in time. In our third fallback position, or I guess our second fallback position, if the state of Wisconsin closed us, then we would simply be home remotely, sending materials and doing virtual instruction. Though we have to do a better job with virtual than we did before, and we have no excuse not to, since we've had some time to plan. The other time, we'll, we'll take a mulligan on that one because we had 48 hours to do it, so to speak. In regards to your question, Char, will a family have an option to be able to do virtual if they don't, simply don't feel comfortable in being here? Absolutely, positively they will. All we ask of families is really to do, two, to do three things. 
and in the form of an application to do that. The first, what is it that they want to provide, want us to provide for them as a family educationally? What would the plan be? Two, why is it that you're requesting that plan be in place? And three, what would your role be in making that plan a success? And we've already created sort of a, a, a short form application for that. Because what we can't do is on some random Wednesday in the middle of September, somebody's articulating, well, I just don't feel safe and we need a virtual education for my kid and please send home stuff today. That's gonna be very difficult because that would be one kid. What if we have 175 kids in the district do that? That's gonna be impossible to sustain for instructors because they'd be teaching all day long and then after hours or any prep time during the day, they'd be doing virtual and that is unsustainable. So we wanna know who they are prior to the school year and we want to go ahead and provide them what they need before the school year starts. Is there so a that deadline would be the in place question. for that? I'm sorry, Sean. Is go there a ahead. deadline in place for that? We haven't established a deadline, but it makes sense to me that we would need to know that well before the school year starts. Our goal is probably the middle of August to be able to know who you are. Because when you responded in survey, the 57 folks that said we're hesitant to be back or we're not coming back, we don't know who they are. They just responded that that was their answer. So we're gonna put out the call, if you will, and you'll let us know, and we'll work with those families. It's a, it's a quicker path from the question being asked about virtual or remote to it happening if you have a situation where a student has COVID, do they have someone in their home that has COVID? That's a much quicker path because there's obviously a very easy answer to why are you doing this? So these, these applications, um, they're of, of the reason why they want to do virtual, that's pretty much discretionary, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. I mean, it can't be, I mean, basically they should have a compromised health or some reason why medical reason why they can't attend school in person. We, we, we're simply asking folks to articulate their concerns and, and I'm not here to be the judge on concerns. I'm simply here wanting to know who they are so we can work with them via building principles to make it happen. Because it's gonna be difficult to do if we sort of make it up as we go. Having that information ahead of time would be very helpful. So that's our goal. How um, does this impact staff who are concerned or hesitant or reluctant to come back to school themselves? Well, there are a great many HR related questions in regards to the safety of staff. That's a very well-founded concern. You're putting yourself in the midst of others when in many cases, folks have been socially isolated since the middle of March. So when they come back to school, the question immediately is, well, what if I have someone in my class or I myself have contracted COVID? How does that all play out? Well, the law on that topic is fast moving. It's deep in regards to the, how verbose it is, but here's the short form answer to what, in essence, the law says. Staff have an additional 10 sick days that are associated with any positive COVID related reason, whether it's they have to go in quarantine because their son was positive or they themselves were. Those are 10 days that they are paid. Then they have their own sick days after that. What I'm here to um, state is what I shared with certified staff last week, my promise to you would be to bring policy to the board in the month of August which has us working with staff. Because if a staff person has to go into quarantine three or four times, they very well would deplete their sick bank down to nothing. And in some cases, if they're a new staff person, they don't have that many days in their sick bank. If you've been here for 30 years, rest assured you'd have quite a few, but they feel as if it's not fair to have to use all those days. And I agree with them. This is nothing they've ever asked for. They've been very responsible and now they have to deplete their bank because of that. Now, in regards to how a staff person or a student gets excluded from the school environment because of COVID, the very last page of the PowerPoint indicates what that flow chart is. Polk County Health is the organization that helps us make that call, who gets uh, isolated from school. And we've already had to attend to that chart with a couple of potential scares in the district here over the course of the last month. Hope I've answered your question. I know I've gotten into more words than perhaps I should have spoken. Um, 
I guess, I guess that wasn't my question, though. Okay, sorry. My question was, um, so we have an option for parents who don't feel comfortable sending their kids back to school for whatever that reason may be. Yes. What is our option for staff who do not feel comfortable coming back to school? In the law, there is no option. There are six qualifying conditions, and simply not feeling comfortable to come back to school is not one of those qualifying conditions in the eyes of the law. Well, some of the qualifying conditions would be the obvious. I am positive for COVID. I have a family member who is positive for COVID. I am directly in responsible for a spouse that has COVID, that, those types of things. But there isn't for I'm generally nervous about coming back to school. It's not a qualifying condition. Good question. <clears throat> Are there other questions? And specifically, perhaps, about the options for school weeks other than a five-day. Are we aware of any staff that would not want to come back to school because of No one has formally declared that intent to me or to a building principal that I, or a supervisor that I'm aware of. Are there folks that are concerned? I would say with certainty there is, but no one's articulated, I'm not coming back to school. No one said that to me. And no supervisor has reported to me that I have a staff person that's not coming back. You'll probably hear more from staff after the... Um after we develop a safety plan on maybe. next Monday when they actually know what they are, are yeah, maybe not so. required to do. Because right now it's up in the air, nobody knows. So I know, I guess I think I would just, it would be helpful to know if before we go into making those decisions, how if there's some staff who spoke about it tonight, um, just their concerns, but I, I think, I mean, if we were to know, um, if you don't this, then I'm not coming back or I don't feel comfortable coming back. Um, do we lose teachers because of it? Do we lose admin because of it? I don't know. And those, I, I would like to know before we have that. Before Monday. <laughs> yeah, before we make those decisions. And then, then the decision's been made and then we hear, well, I'm not coming back. I will ask the question and see what folks have to say. So the next slide that you see, uh, this, the district leadership team recommends we have a five-day week, September 1st experience in, in, in person, extra safety measures in place. We're going to get to those here in a little bit. And this is the recommendation strongly supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics, meaning specifically to have kids back in action. And it's a lot about social and emotional wellness, and I don't know that anyone would be very surprised by that. Instructional programming, the leadership team is recommending that the district begin with in-person instruction. The fallback option is sort of that hybrid. And then the third is an entirely remote virtual learning experience. And I'm here to tell you the third option there on the page is, in essence, a school closure type situation. And where that goes, I, I couldn't even begin to tell you. No idea. Bus transportation. Um, from the get-go on this, the, the, the biggest area of concern that was brought up was the impossibility of socially distancing on a bus. You have a bus with a capacity of 78 kids, that's a standard bus capacity. If you socially distance a bus, meaning six feet, you're separating kids by six feet, you will get 11 kids on each bus. 11 kids out of 78, so your bus capacity is about 15 or so percent. We bus on a given day about 750 in the morning and about 750 in the evening. Our bus routes typically run from beginning to end from the moment that a bus driver arrives in the bus garage to the time they depart, about an hour and a half. And that's true at the end of the day as well. But if you wanted to socially distance on a bus and do 11 per bus, your bus routes would run in the morning between 6 a.m. and 10, and your bus routes in the evening would run from 3 to 7 if you did 11 people per bus. That's impossible because what do you do with the kid that's waiting for the bus to come back not once but twice between 3 and 7? I'm not sure that there's anyone here that's volunteering to stay back with the kids until 6.30 when they get on the bus, and that's also inconvenient for parents. So. What we need to do is to reduce the number of kids that are on the bus, not by kicking you in off the bus, because any kid that wants to ride on the bus, we're going to give a ride on the bus, and we're not turning anyone away. But we're encouraging parents to drive them. 
That's the safest method and also is the quickest method by which to solve the problem of crowding on the bus. So what we're going to do as a district, and this is gonna happen at the end of July, we're gonna ask everyone to declare their intent. Do you need bus transportation or you don't need bus transportation? So on September 1st, we can have a smaller number than 750. The hopeful number is 50% of that. We're shooting to be under 400. Districts that have asked about that, they have asked, um, have, have seen about a 50% decrease, as in people have said, I'm just gonna drive them myself. So there is the potential to reduce that number. And we're gonna need that number in place in those names in place by August 7th. And then Tom, our bus transportation person who wasn't able to be here with us this evening, uh, we can reorganize our bus routes. Because in some cases we have 78 kids. Our biggest route is the Deer Park route is 78. It's pretty much every single day. And we have some that are in the low 30s. So we can reconstitute some of those routes and we can then uh, have fewer kids on the bus to be able to do that. So we're gonna ask folks to make that intent and we're gonna be adamant that we hear from everyone because we don't wanna show up on the first day and three kids are standing at the bus stop expecting a ride when we have to tell them, sorry, you didn't sign up. We need to hear from everyone. So we're gonna have to aggressively ask for those answers. So that'll be coming here at the end of the month. Bus routes are already arranged to have the, the, the fewest minutes possible. I'm here to tell you, if you live out near Star Prairie, you're gonna be on the bus longer than if you live in town. That's just the geography of the day. Students who ride the bus will be required to wear a face mask. Polk County Health has said very little that with certainty, but they've said that with certainty. It, though to use the words of Polk County Health from last week, it is a no-brainer to have kids be required to wear a mask on the bus because there's no other place for them to go there's no ventilation on the bus. Every single school in the county is doing the exact same thing on that measure, requiring kids to wear a mask on the bus. So that is the recommendation here this evening. And lastly, for bus drivers to wear a mask as well. Any questions about bus transportation? Because it's a big topic. So many. Um, what do we do for occasional riders? So we have kids who are in sports after school, middle school and so they're not staying after school they're staying after school normally for practice practice gets canceled mom dad can't be there to pick them up or somebody else can't be there to pick them up they have to ride the bus what do we do so we're gonna have to ask and ask again and ask again and ask again and ask again we're gonna have to continue to update those bus lists and, and if the truth be told Char when we talk buses after school we're talking athletics too because if you bring football to name your location you're bringing the team plus the coaches plus the other folks involved and you're, you're running towards 50 and 60 people on a 78 person bus, you're not socially distanced there at all. So that's a double bus route, which yes, comes with it an extra price and an extra inconvenience of two buses. So what do we do? We're gonna have to continue to ask and update those lists because it's unrealistic to say, all right, make your declar declaration for the whole school year on September 1st or actually the first week of August and that's your answer, you can't change your answer. Well, that would be unrealistic. We need people to be able to declare that intent. So we're gonna have to continue to ask. I mean, what if practice is just canceled that night? I mean, for whatever yep. reason, weather or whatever yep. reason. Um, and then all of a sudden, what do we do with weather in wintertime? School's out at right. one o'clock and parents aren't planning to pick their kids up until five or whatever that night. What do we do then? Well, we typically don't do an early release, but your example of all of a sudden a kid has decided to ride the bus, that's entirely realistic, it happens rather frequently. We're gonna have to be a little more steadfast about who's on the bus and who's not, because if we have a, a hard and fast number on September 1st, if that goes out the window by the end of September, we're right back to 750 kids on a bus, and that's not gonna work. We won't be able to socially distance. If we're doing double and triple bus routes, that's gonna be impossible. So, but are we going to turn a kid away to say, you know? No, we'll never, I don't think we can by law turn a kid away. I wouldn't want to do that, but we're gonna have to be on top of that number as much as possible to keep that number as low as possible. I'm hopeful that parents will understand the situation is, it's probably best for me to transport them. We need to keep this number down. So I'm gonna transport my own kid. That's my hope, but I can't say that's gonna happen for sure. I don't know who, it is, who is, uh, who's in the category of needing transportation. I couldn't begin to tell you. I, there's so many parents that work 
Mm -hmm. that have to leave for work or can't absolutely. Can't, absolutely can't bring their kids to school or come and get their kids to if school. If it's 750 on September September 1st or the beginning of August, if we hear in 750 people intending to ride the bus, we got ourselves a very big problem. We're going to have to do a double and triple bus route, and that is going to result in three and four hours on the road and kids not being to school at the beginning of the day or having to be after school many hours. I mean, that's just reality. So if we have a five-day school week, that's a reality of this picture. Are we opening our schools earlier then for parents to drop kids off? Well, we're in the midst of those plans of pick up and drop off. The area where it's the, the, the biggest ticket is elementary intermediate because those kids obviously don't drive. Uh, Cheryl and Ora Lee have already begun to meet with staff about how to create those plans and we're meeting again this week. Uh, I'm meeting with them to try and figure out what that looks like because we also have the factor of clubhouse because kids are staying beyond the end of the day and then they're going to clubhouse and then they're uh, being picked up but there's that factor that fits into this too. So we're, we're, we're meeting to try and figure that out. It's not, nothing we've ever done before which sort of is the title of this entire presentation. <laughs> There's no COVID file that we went back and grabbed out of the filing cabinet. It just doesn't exist. So we're trying to figure that out. Yeah, I mean, I think that we're gonna need to figure out a better system for drop-offs because, you know, at some of the schools, it gets crowded already as it is. And if you double that, triple that number of parents that are dropping off kids, you know, again, you, you're gonna probably need to, we're gonna need a longer window of drop-off and we're gonna need maybe a better traffic flow system sure. um, because to go like to go into the elementary school and then have to go back around to get back into the schools I mean I don't know what that system will look like but um, again I don't want to be the arbiter of all information and I certainly don't want to put someone on the spot but Cheryl can I put you on the spot about that topic because <laughs> we talked this morning about perhaps what it would look like at the end of the day as opposed to what it looks like now could you come up and try and help us with that if I don't have the answers, Cheryl must have the answers. <laughs> I don't have the answer. <laughs> we have had conversations at the elementary school. My leadership team has met, and we are talking about loading buses and being able to load them in a safe way because I don't know which one of our staff members said they're all out in the hall at the same time and we need to avoid that. So we have some ideas of how to do that. It will take longer to load the buses. Um, I'm guessing at least 20 minutes to load at the elementary school because basically the process that we have in place is the teachers will be dropping them off at every bus so that the kids can wait in their classrooms. Um, we're also talking about what you're talking about, the actual pickup of children. We are not um, one of the recommendations that I'm sure Dr. Durfler is going to get to is that we won't have volunteers or parents in the buildings. And so we are, um, and we have a separate meeting to discuss this with Nina from Clubhouse, and I believe Oralee is involved in that conversation as well. But we're talking about um, having families, uh, kind of like our bag pickup at the elementary school. People drove up. We got their name, we radioed in, got their bag. We'll do the same thing, except it'll be a human that will come out instead of their bag of goodies. Um, as far as the traffic flow, I think that is a concern, and it is something that we will need to discuss further as an administrative team. Did that answer? Is that what you were thinking, Sean, that I was going to share? <laughs> Well, it's not a final answer by any means, but it's the answer as it exists right now. We have to figure out a lot of logistical items, and this is one of those logistical items to figure out. It's one of the biggest tickets of them all, because you want to keep kids safe, but you also want them to transport, and you want it to be done in a timely way. It's going to take longer. It'll get faster as we go, but it's going to take longer at the beginning. We won't be leaving at 325. We'll probably be leaving at 345, which puts them home at 450 as opposed to 430. It's not ideal. But to keep them safe, the 20 minutes is worth it. <clears throat> In regards to high school and middle school, I'm not here to say that those kids don't ride the bus. They do, they're just not as frequently riding the bus. We have kids at the high school. It's, it's probably cooler to leave high school and get in your own vehicle than get on the bus. Having been in high school and having been at the high school, I get that, but some kids ride the bus. 
and they're going to have to have the same accommodations. We don't have as many, so there isn't the traffic flow out of this building. It just doesn't look like that. It looks like that at the elementary and intermediate. And yes, I'm here to tell you this is not a secret. We do have traffic pattern issues on campus at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. If you get here after 7.50, find something nice to listen to on the radio because you might be in there for a little while. And that's a reality. So we're going to have to figure out what that looks like. So the conversation has already begun. Other questions about school transportation. So if we have parents declare if their children want to ride the buses by Friday, August 7th, yes. does that give you guys enough time to put plans it, in place? It does. Uh, Tom has software that can put together bus routes in a real big hurry. All the, all the kids are in the system. He, he literally can queue up any bus in any location and it spits it out in a real big hurry. Okay. But we're going to have to reconstitute some of that. But there are some issues where it just there's nothing to really create. If you're out towards Deer Park or Star Prairie, it's not practical to run two and three buses out that way. But if you're in town, there are two or three bus routes that hit those kids. So that is just the creation of the geography of our district. Okay, here's another real unpopular question. Go ahead. If we're going to require kids to wear masks on the bus, who polices it? That bus driver already has so much to worry about and so much to watch. Correct. And then what is the consequence for the child not wearing the mask on the bus? Those are two very unpopular questions, but thank you. The, fir the first question is who polices it? The obvious person is the bus driver, and I'm here to tell you right now, it's not realistic to say that that's going to occur. They're A, driving the bus, hopefully keeping it safely on the road moving forward, especially in the winter months that they drive in. And B, they're having to make sure that kids are remaining in their seats. C, other related shenanigans of not remaining in their seats. And then D, you're now asking them to make sure we have kids with masks on. In some kids that wouldn't have masks, they're not doing anything malicious. They're simply taking their mask off and sharing it with someone next to them, which they shouldn't do, but that might very well occur. I don't think it's realistic to say you pull over the bus and you reprimand that kid. So what are you gonna do to a kid, if you will, that doesn't wear a mask, I don't think there's any consequence. We want to make sure that as many kids as possible are wearing a mask in the time they're on the bus. And thankfully, many kids are on the bus for 10, 15 minutes, not 45. I think it's a small ask on the bus for that short a time to try and keep us more safe. But is there a consequence, a slip or a suspension? Or I, I don't think that's appropriate at all. In, in our masks, and are we required on the bus for all ages? Because I know there's sometimes an exception for kids under a certain age. We can certainly write whatever we want to okay. in regards to exceptions. And there are certainly kids that are older that it simply wouldn't work. They have a health condition or socially and emotionally, it just wouldn't be fitting for them. We would certainly be gracious about that. We, we don't want to in any way make things worse by the requirement of a mask. We're just trying to keep as many safe as possible. The next item on the agenda is school breakfast and lunch. Uh, we have, and I would like to give a shout out to Stacy Nelson over the course of, basically since we've been closed, very shortly thereafter, we've been providing meals to some 500 or so over the course of March, April, May, June, now into July, and coming to a wrap up here in the month of August. Thanks to her and thanks to her staff and thanks to many folks in the room that have simply volunteered their time to box up and give out what was going to be distributed to those families. It's been instrumental in them keeping their lives together because some folks depend on us for their meals. We have 40% of our school population that is free and reduced lunch. They need our help. So we're happy to be able to do that. It hasn't been anything we had a plan to be able to do, but having met with Stacy today, she said, they're already done, as in we've gotten better at this over time. It's nothing we want to get better at, but if we're gonna do it, let's try and be as good as possible. So our plan for breakfast and lunch, you'll see that in front of you if you have the PowerPoint. Students will eat lunch in the cafeteria. We are confident we will be able to socially distance them enough to be able to do that. The number of students who eat in the cafeteria at one time will be reduced. We've changed some schedules in certain spots to reduce the number of kids that would be there. 
Students will be socially distanced in the cafeteria. We literally, in some cases, will put dots on seats so they know exactly where they're supposed to sit. I know dots on seats probably won't be the most popular thing at the high school or the middle school, but I think they can adjust and they'll get over it. I know it's very elementary in style, but they can follow that plan too, probably. All surfaces will be sanitized before and after use in conversation with Stacy today. It was um, the conversation ran towards what can you safely put on surfaces during the day. There's a product that's coming out that you can use for sanitizing and disinfecting. We're looking to see what the price point on that is. Uh, but we will always clean after, we always have, and we will absolutely clean after hours in a way we've never done before to make it as safe as possible. All food will be served to students. There isn't any self-serve options anymore. This is guidance that we've been given. Students, this is a very new thing. Students will have a barcode that they can scan, so there's no touching of the keypad anymore. So they simply will be able to scan it. It'll run across the scanner and they'll key in. Because if you're not familiar with lunch, they have to show up and press their numbers. So if every kid at the elementary presses their numbers, that's 300 plus kids pressing their numbers, which obviously could be a problem. A la carte will remain as normal and school nutrition staff would be required to wear a mask. So those are the recommendations for school breakfast and lunch. Can you explain that barcode scanning a little more for me? Maybe Stacy and Clint could do a better job on explaining that. Could you come up, Stacy, and talk to us about that a little bit? So the logistics of it are still being worked out and exactly how it will look. Um, each grade level may be different. The elementary, I don't necessarily expect all of the kids to be able to be responsible for a little card. Um, talks has been to kind of implement it in the same way that 4K currently goes through the meal line, and it's all on a sheet. So we would just match the kid with the name and scan it for them quickly as they go through. Um, possible talks for the older children, um, kind of like we have our IDs on a lanyard just kind of implement it in that sort of a fashion. Um, the goal is just to eliminate the high touch. So the ID card would essentially have their lunch number on it, the same number that they would punch in, just eliminating that. And they would be responsible for scanning that themselves? Well, my staff would still scan it. Okay. There would still be a staff there, but there's no touching, so a non-contact service. And then would like the high, like anybody that would have a card, they would have to have their card with them every day for lunch, or would they have a number that they could just tell the person standing there and taking the? Yeah, it would be the same number. So if they know their lunch number, they could always just give that. The issue of just going that route is that it's really loud in the lunchroom. So having a staff member try to hear every number would be kind of difficult. At the elementary school now, or maybe at the intermediate school, it, it seems like there is someone who is actually punching it in for them and they just see each kid or, you know? No, she, they give, they punch in their number. Each so kid she, does. I know she has her little process of going from side to side. Okay. Other questions for Stacy in regards to the recommendations as a whole, because I know I ran through a variety of stuff here on this particular slide. Oh, salad bar. So no salad bar at the high school, right? I know, I'm really sad about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that too, but could we, is there talks into work that um, instead of just having it on the bar, like it's prepackaged and then the kids yep. could just take it or so, that there's salads made and they take them? Um, last year, I think was the first year that we offered salad of the week. So we'll still offer that, and then I'm brainstorming different ways that they can still get, because they love it. Mm -hmm. They love the salad bar. Um, so even just portioning the toppings right. and letting them build it their own, but already prepackaged is kind of what I'm leaning towards. Okay. That's what I was thinking too. My Perfect. daughter was very concerned. <laughs> <laughs> we will have salads in one way or the other. I thought you would. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Stacey. Yep. Now, please note the recommendations as they exist are going to require more man hours from food service to, to, to prep the items in the way that we're recommending that they be prepped, which does increase your cost. But I'm here to tell you if we have an increased cost to increase safety, 
we're always going to opt for safety. It, it's just a reality of the situation in the same way that it increases cost for bus transportation because you're paying a driver for a longer portion of time or their day. It's just the reality of the situation. Just for full disclosure, so that's out there. Athletics. Oh, one other question oh, about sorry. that. So does that, <clears throat> does that mean that there will be an extra lunchtime like at the high school and is that change the whole bell schedule, you know, the whole kind of school Well, schedule? we still have, to my knowledge, we still have three lunches at the high school and we haven't created something in addition to that. Our goal was to have as few kids in the cafeteria as possible and in conversation with Josh, it, he is confident that with three lunches, we have a number that's small enough to be able to shoulder that. The building that it's the most difficult to work this out in is the intermediate, because their cafeteria simply isn't that large. And Stacy and Aurelie and I are meeting this week to try and figure out how to do that. Because um, their setting, the geography of their building, is it's just not a huge space. And this is the way it is. It's middle school's got a big cafeteria, intermediate just doesn't. Okay, athletics. This has been uh, one of the more difficult topics of this whole picture because it all of a sudden the plug just got pulled, so to speak, in March and then we were all gone and then no sports were played. Literally, people had loaded buses and driven to state competition for girls basketball and were ready to take the court to play and things stopped right there. We have a neighbor that that happened to, Clear Lake. and. That was certainly met with much resistance, but as you know, this thing happened fast. So then there was talk about let's have a July sports season uh, in that the spring sports season would then become July. It became difficult for districts in that a lot of kids have other things going on in July, some of which are seniors and they've left to do other things all together. So the July sports season didn't meet with a lot of um, reception and it, it, it just it didn't occur. So now we're facing what do we do with fall sports? We have fall sports and Mr. Fern's going to be up here in a minute. We've got them firing up here in a matter of three weeks. And I'm here to tell you that fall sports looks different based on the sports. So you see on this particular slide in the example I gave in my narrative many times, there's a lot more social distancing in golf than there is in football. There's a lot more social distancing in tennis than there is in soccer. So that very much is a consideration here. Further, there is a difference in competition. We may be moderate risk or high risk, but we could be traveling to another place where the, the, the risk is low or the risk is high. We're heading to Arcadia to play football. Arcadia is three hours down the road. Who knows what their risk level would be there. But 75%, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Fern, why don't you come up to the mic, because this is certainly going to be up here soon, is with middle border competition. Baldwin and Ellsworth and Prescott and Somerset, et cetera. That's our conference schedule. And that's what we're looking at here after some non-conference competition in the fall. We're right into our conference schedule for all of our sports. So if you look at the next slide, it says different sports have different COVID risk. And you'll see their examples of high risk activity are certainly wrestling, football, across rugby, competitive cheer, dance. Those are all where you have high contact and close proximity, then your medium list and then your low list. The next list is the sports risk level and that is something that Polk County Health has created. So I'm gonna have Mr. Fern walk through that for us if he could please and I will certainly help where I can. Yeah, so we're, we're really working with Polk County Health to make decisions in terms of competition. So, uh, like Mr. Durfler said, if we're considered a high risk county, which we are right now, we're gonna go participate. Uh, say we're gonna play a team in St. Croix County, they're a medium risk, we cannot play that game as of right now, that, that match, whatever it is, simply because one of the schools is high risk. Um, that's been black and white. We're meeting with all Polk County school administrators and athletic directors on July 28th. I believe. Yes. Um, also meeting with the middle border 
athletic directors on July 21st um, to talk about where we're at. But this is a fluid situation. Um, we're going to really rely on Polk County Health to make these decisions um, in terms of if we're going to be able to participate um, in competitions. Um, I honestly don't foresee a championship season for the fall. Um, to be completely honest, statewide, I see it being local control. Um, but no decisions have been made at this time. I think you guys are hearing things at the professional level, the collegiate level. Um, again, no decisions at the high school level. So let's be clear about what we're talking about here. Polk County is deemed high risk. Every Wednesday, Polk County Health sends out to whoever is interested what the risk level for every county is. We're, as of last Wednesday, high risk. So if we're high risk, our competitions in the fall for our fall sports are in question, as in they wouldn't occur if we're high risk. That's a reality of this situation right and now, and people need to start coming to terms with the fact that that's a reality. And what makes Polk County high risk? Uh, it's the incidence of number of um, COVID-19 cases, the percent, and more so the percent increase from week to week. So because uh, our numbers are low, if we have just a couple of positive cases, the percentage, right? Is the that percentage correct? increase is what percentage Polk County uses. Big. Right? Is that yeah, correct? so like I, I think in June when I presented, I want to say we had 38 positive cases. I think before the meeting there's 75 cases. Obviously a fluid number, um, but that percent increase. You know, we don't have 13,000 cases like Milwaukee County, but we're starting to increase. We looked at St. Croix County a couple weeks ago. They were at 130 cases. The next week I believe it was 238 cases. They're 260 as of today, and Polk County is 65 as of today. So, but those numbers don't take into account the additional testing that's been going on either, I mean, from week to week, or does that? Well, all I'm here to say is that Polk County is deeming what risk level we are. We are not going to play doctor on this one. So whatever Polk County says we are, that's what we are. We're high risk, and we've been high risk as of last Wednesday up through today. And then, but that those... Um, are set by not just county to county, that's set by? That's set by the Department of Health Services in Madison for every county statewide. in the state. Statewide. Okay. Yep. You can go on their website to see if you're a high risk, if you're moderate risk, low risk. So as of last Wednesday, we're high risk. I have no idea what it'll say this Wednesday or the Wednesday thereafter and the Wednesday of September or whatever when we're in the midst of our seasons. I couldn't begin to tell you, but right now, high risk would equal we wouldn't be playing. And that's not a recommendation. That's just if we choose to follow WIAA's recommendation and Polk County and Wisconsin Department of Health recommendation, that's what we would be doing for athletics as a school district. And the Polk County schools are doing that, and it sounds to me as if the Middle Border Conference schools are doing that. So we would all be on the same page. Because, again, that's 75% so, or more of our competition, just mm -hmm. Middle Border. So practices will continue and go on. It's just every game is going to be tentative, and you weren't going to know until right. Wednesday. It's going to be a fluid week. situation. Um, every week's going to look different. If our opponent happens to have an outbreak, uh, we might be out of competition that week or for mm -hmm. that day, depending that on sense. the sport. So it's going to look different. There's different proposals I saw from the southwest part, part of the state. Mr. Durfler sent it to me today and, you know, moving the fall season to the spring, the spring season to the summer. There's different ideas. We want to give kids competition. Um, they've been robbed of their winter championship seasons last year, uh, obviously robbed of their spring seasons last year. Uh, but how are we going to do that safely? And as you guys, I mean, within the news and whatnot, these numbers are increasing. We've got to get things to settle down a little bit before we're going to be able to compete. So I can't see it very well on this paper, but didn't it even say, like, if you're at high risk, you couldn't practice? If you look at the appendix all, of, at, all the way at the end of the presentation, uh -huh. it would be, oh, I don't have it here. Nope, it's not in this. It's not here. Every, every sport is different. A lot of times it's the, the, the recommendation is groups of 10, um, and then it's like individual skill work, no team skill work, individual skill work. But typically you can still practice, but in pod, pods of 10. And any talk about 
um, not necessarily keeping conferences the same way that they are currently or that you're just focusing on area versus conference or? Yeah, I mean, I, I foresee if, we'll use football as an example. Um, mm -hmm. It's easier with just one game for the week. If we happen to not have, be able to compete with another school, we're moderate risk so we technically can compete. There's a Lakeland school that has 11 man football. They're in the same boat as us. Wouldn't surprise me if we would try to work something out to give our kids an opportunity to play. But there's there's no talk of actually just changing the schedule to keep it. Polk County of, or St. Croix County. Right. There at this time there is not talk. Okay. With that and there's you know with certain sports there's there's different barriers too. Like I just mentioned football. Some schools have eight man football. Some schools have 11 man football. But there's you know this thing is changing and evolving and. Um, and every sport is different. Activity out of the WIA is picking up speed in a hurry. I think folks throughout June and July were holding out hopes we're good to go for the fall, and now people are starting to realize that might not be the case. And the trick is in Middlebury Conference, we have two, two Pierce County schools, four uh, St. Croix County schools, and two Polk County schools, and all three of them are high risk. Right. So that makes it difficult. Other questions about athletics, no decisions, again, have been made about fall sports or spring sports or winter sports for that matter, but this is where the WIA is positioned presently. And if we follow WIAA guidance, right now we're high risk and we'll see what that looks like in the days to come. I, I'll end with, we're, we're trying to remain optimistic for the, I mean, one, for the mental health of our kids. We've yeah. started some workouts, obviously some restrictions, um, but these kids want to compete, so we're trying to remain optimistic, and we're not sharing a ton of this information. Obviously, this is public, and you can share what, whatever, whatever information you have, but uh, we do have a few weeks on our side uh, that can work for us or potentially against us, too. Since you're here, um, weight room opened up July 1st? Correct. And how's that going? Uh, it's great. We... Uh, have six different sessions, um, 16 kids in a session. However, eight kids are in the, in the weight room and then eight kids are out doing conditioning. We try to do the conditioning outside. Um, we've had a great turnout. We've opened it up to middle school students also, uh, but all those sessions are full on the sign up. They're encouraged to work out in that same pod each week. Um, but I would say we're averaging somewhere between 10 and 12 kids in a session. And so. have we been able to kind of just stick with those kids sticking yes. in that same sign up? Yep. Slot? It hasn't been perfect uh, with vacations and plans sure. and work schedules and things like that. Uh, but for the most part, it's been, it's been very consistent. And the kids are required to sanitize, right, after they get done? And how's they that are, going? Yep. Yep. Self-sanitizing? Yep, it's good. I'll, I'll, to be honest, the social distancing is challenging. Um, you know, we're doing the best we can, but the sanitizing um, is going well. Um, each station has a sanitizer and then also in our auxiliary lift area too there's different options for the kids to sanitize their, their equipment. Uh, it's kind of a new normal for them. They're supposed to sanitize before they use the, the equipment and then after they use the equipment. Um, and we've also increased our supervision for both our morning and our evening sessions to help with that. Okay. Good to know. Other questions for Mr. Fern? Okay, thank you very much. I made reference earlier to technological issues. I certainly want to make clear the issues of internet access are not an Amory or a Polk County thing. This is a nationwide problem. When you're gonna send X number of students home for virtual education and folks are at home and mom and dad potentially are at home and everyone's seeking to use the internet, you're gonna create inherent issues. We have sought to understand the nature of the problem, as in how many folks have internet and how many folks don't, just plain and simple have a connection. And what we need to do in addition to that is to find out via our, our um, parents, what are the issues? Is it that you don't have it or it doesn't work? And then we have to come up with solutions, to target that. And we've already started trying to figure out how to address the issue. We've worked with local providers and independent third-party options. 
there aren't solutions that we've come across for internet access and internet usability that we have established thus far through local or independent options. And that is disheartening, but that is a reality. So I'm, welcome, I'm welcoming any questions you have here and now, and I'm gonna ask Clint to come up because he is our IT guy and he could perhaps help answer those. And I will certainly do my best as well, but on all things IT, I typically refer to Clint. Well, it's not your fault, right? No, nope, it's not my fault. <laughs> That's his standard answer. It's not my fault. It's Lonnie's. No. <laughs> oh, really? There you go. Well, that works. Well, I, I mean, this is not just for Clint, but will we, I mean, obviously we have devices for the older kids, and, you know, with school starting, we can get those devices in their hands. I'm wondering, you know, will we encourage kids to take them home in case something occurs and then they will have a device. I mean, obviously that was really helpful that we had devices for all the older students that when we were forced to go into quarantine that they had those devices and we were, you know, teachers were able to connect that way, send home assignments, you know, keep up to date. So I'm just kind of wondering, I guess, you know, will we encourage students to take them home on a daily basis? How, how young will we encourage kids to take their devices home or have devices? That's, that's being discussed in, in buildings, specific to the buildings. <clears throat> High school, obviously, you take it home. Middle school, they've been working on it as needed. And then the intermediate and elementary, they've been discussing on options and how they're going to go about doing that if we get into that position. Mm -hmm. Or slowly have the kids take them home, getting used to it. Hopefully, we would have some lead time. But if a kid, you know, finds out they've been exposed or something, you know, or maybe there's a way that they could come and pick up their device. But, you, you know, I just think if you're going to be required to not attend school for the next two weeks, it would be nice if you had a device in order to stay connected. And, again, you know, how that looks and, and who's doing that education because, obviously, the teacher hopefully will still be in class with everyone else who's working with that student. You know, how are they getting their assignments? Who's touching base with them? So... Yeah, we're working on it, and uh, <clears throat> the high school will be, be handed out real soon. Middle school will be the first day of school, but if it comes, if, if we get shut down before then, we would have a plan out how to get them devices out to the kids. If we have to go full virtual, it's going to be all hands on deck with devices at the intermediate and elementary as well. We can't say you're doing virtual and not provide them the device to be able to do that, so we're going to have to do that, and we'll have a plan to be able to do that at that point. We're starting in person five days a week on September 1st, but who knows what it looks like on October 1st. We might be sending iPads home in elementary kids. That's reality. Yeah, now, I mean, the packets, I think the packets worked very well sure. for a lot of the elementary kids. You know, they don't always need to be on a device all the time. Correct. But, you know, that they had that, that material, that instruction. But, you know, I guess I'm also thinking about those kids that, are required to, I mean, because we'll get to that, I guess, in a minute, but the kids that are required to not attend school because they've been deemed that they were exposed, you know, what does that look like for them? We've had conversations. Um, I've had some with some of the principals, and we're throwing some things around how to address the kids that have to be home or the kids that are asking to be home. Um, we're still working on that, but it is, we are got some ideas what we're tossing around. Our goal is to have uh, next week to, in essence, move to open schools by the beginning to middle of August to have what fallback position for hybrid model looks like. We don't have that down here and now, and the hybrid model would involve the virtual piece to have that in parents' hands so they can make an educated decision about whether they even want to do that. And to execute that plan to the best of our ability. A couple of factors beyond our control, their ability to access internet and the quality of their internet, that's very beyond our control. And we've really kicked the tires on every option we can think of to get that done. That is a huge problem nationwide, not just an Amory and Polk County issue. I mean, I, I've heard of kids that were coming to the high school and just sitting in the parking lot, you know, in order to get internet access um, or going to the library, you know, a mom and a and the son were driving to the library and sitting in the library parking lot in order to use the internet there. 
to hook up because they didn't have access at home. So, I mean, I guess, yeah, it's, you know. It, it's really slow. If what I was told, anybody had cable or fiber to their house, they didn't have a lot of issues. It's people who had DSL is where the issues really came in. And obviously you see them pulling fiber everywhere, but they're years away from getting that done. And it's, and it's not Amory, it's not Clear Lake, it's nationwide. It's an issue. And it's like going on the freeway at five o'clock at night, piling everybody in there and trying to get home at a time and you can't do it. It's kind of the same scenario. Other items for Clint. Okay, I'm gonna need some help here moving forward, likely from Mr. Sigsworth and uh, Mrs. Seaman in regards to health and safety. That's the next batch of information. There are four categories of information when you're talking health and safety. There's proper hygiene, sanitizing and disinfecting classrooms, sanitizing and disinfecting common areas, and lastly, face masks and face coverings. The proper hygiene, this is by no means my own creation. This is per the CDC. This is something that all of us have probably seen before, the washing of hands and avoided touching your eyes, nose, mouth with unwashed hands, practice good respiratory etiquette, coughing and sneezing, avoid close contact with people who are sick, stay home if sick, and if you have a pre-existing health condition, certainly recognize that those factors are very important. So those are items that we are ingraining right into our curriculum. I have kids myself at Clubhouse. The very first order of business when they arrive is to wash their hands. It just becomes part of their normal routine. And we'll have to work with all of our kids at all levels to be able to do that. So that is the first slide that goes with the um, notion of health and safety. The second, and if I could have Mr. Sigsworth join us here at the mic. I'm not sure where he's located, but I'm sure he's on his way. Sanitizing and disinfecting classrooms. This is something we had already been doing. Certainly this situation has put it on the radar in a bigger way. So I'm gonna run through what I have here on the slide and I know you'll probably have questions. We're looking at classrooms being sanitized and disinfected during the school day by teachers and custodians. Classrooms being sanitized and disinfected after school hours, which certainly was already happening. High touch areas such as doorknobs, door handles, desktops, chairs, common classroom spaces every day. Hand sanitizer being provided in each classroom and students being encouraged to bring their hand sanitizer to school as well. So those are just some of the methods that we're seeking to use to keep this as a healthier and safer, safer environment in classrooms. So now your really hard questions for George. Air quality. Yes, we're, we will be uh, upping the outside air, um, probably a quarter to 50%, depending on um, what time of day in the morning when we can use some of that cool air outside to help cool the building, we may use even more, economize with that. Um, and obviously exchanging the air is, is, uh, will help um, with the spread. Do we have to do anything special with filters? Do we change them more often? Is there different filters that we can use than what we're using now? How does that play a role? Uh, good question. Um, we, as a district, change our filters probably uh, more than any district that I know of. So I don't know that we would have to go anymore. I think we're doing it more than we have to now. Um, so four times a year is, is unheard of. We do that now. And, I, and basically that was for health and safety for those reasons. It's because you're on it, George. Yeah. <laughs> Product is the biggest issue. Um, just getting your standard bottles. Um, you know, everybody's facing it. Um, and we... Um, We'd love to find the silver bullet that's out there that, you know, you hear about the fog machines and this, that, and the other thing. Uh, anything you're disinfecting with uh, is labeled as a pesticide. And um, if we're using it in classrooms way more than we do now, or if it's not used in the proper fashion, 
we could be doing harm to uh, the kid's health the way it is uh, with the residues um, that are left on the surfaces. So a big thing that I want to make sure we do is anybody that has that disinfectant in their hands, they're educated on how to use it so we don't create any more issues. So that, I guess that brings up a good point. So anything that's classified as a pesticide, um, they would have to have a pesticide applicator's license to apply, right? Uh, did you say applicate? An, yeah, uh, if, they're ap if they're applying it and they're doing that stuff, anything that's classified that way, they would need an applicator's license? Yeah, it's, it's not the same. It's classified differently than like a, a Roundup. Uh, there you have to have an applicator's license. Um, it, anything that kills anything else is labeled as a pesticide, but it doesn't have the health hazards that a weed killer would have or a bee killer or ant killer. So um, basically, um, to, to use a Lysol at home, you, you need to know what's going on with the product label and if something happened or the correct PPE to, to, to have on. Um, that's where we need to make sure. You, a person can do a great job of basically disinfecting if they do a thorough job of cleaning and taking any of that bacteria off that surface. Um, we can do a great job that way. And I think we don't want to, even, even in the weight room, we're not giving them an actual disinfectant to use uh, because if it's not used properly, you know, we're kind of putting ourselves under the gun there a little bit. Right. So we're using a good cleaner and we're just making sure that they're wiping and getting that bacteria off um, that could possibly be spread. But we're looking at plexiglass shields in offices um, and basically upping any of that, those high traffic areas. And that leads right into the next slide. I'll run through those items real quick. All bathrooms sanitized and disinfected two times in the morning, two times in the afternoon. That's a Polk County recommendation. And then after school, as they always were. Hand sanitizers available in common areas. You know them to be typically cafeteria, commons, auditorium, hallways. And all products which are used are going to be approved as safe for students and staff. There are certain things we can't put in the hands of students right. that we could put in the hands of staff. And obviously, it would be very easy to be able to say, hey, everyone do such and such, but we've got to make sure that that's within the, the eyes of the law, so to speak, and safe. I know that we're kind of in the process of replacing all the drinking fountains with the... Uh Bottle fills. The bottle ones, is that probably part of this too? So you It is. To We're going to close drinking fountains yeah. but have all the bottle fillers available. Yeah. And we're going to have, uh, in essence, the directive, with your permission, to be able to say, you need to bring a water bottle to school. I think it's a pretty simple fix if kids could do that. Yeah. And you got a bottle filler. It's more environmentally friendly too. And it avoids it is. The, I know when I just am out at other public places, all the water fountains are basically mm -hmm. bagged off. <laughs> they are. roped off. <laughs> are we having any problems getting enough sanitizers or cleaning solutions? Yeah. I mean, yeah, do you see uh, that? If it's a problem now, I would expect it to be a bigger problem in the fall. Yeah, we, we actually put orders in in late March, knowing that, you know, when we, when this was over, everybody's going to want some. So uh, there are a number of items that uh, are starting to trickle in. Some items uh, you're just not going to get them, or you're going to pay, you know, huge amounts of money, which are hard to stomach. Um, but we've been lucky, um, and we'll, we we had enough disinfectant, uh, neutral cleaners on hand. Um, and we're gonna we're we're comfortable with where we're at with product come the start of school. It's interesting. You could find all of the sanitizer dispensers that you'd like. They're free, but the sanitizer is not. It's interesting how that goes. <laughs> Other questions for George. Oh, 
Okay. Thanks, George. Thanks. The next slide is the fourth of the four items that are underneath the health and safety, and that is face masks and face coverings. The uh, district offers that it is safer to have face masks and face coverings. It is not the safest. I apologize for the typo there. It is safer to be able to do that. It will prevent the community spread of COVID-19. Wearing a face mask or face covering is not always developmentally appropriate for, or practical for an educational setting. The obvious is for younger kids and for kids that have specific needs, whether they be health or otherwise, where it will be difficult to do. The district leadership team is recommending the following. All staff are required to wear a mask a, a, wear a mask or face covering when they are unable to socially distance themselves. And here's what I mean by that. If you're in a class all by yourself, you're the only one around, there isn't any cause to wear a mask. But if you're in a common area such as a classroom with kids or a hallway or a copy room or something of that sort, that a mask would be required. That all students will be required to wear a mask on school transportation. And then all students are recommended to wear a mask or face covering during the duration of the time that they are at school. So those are the recommendations being made to you. And certainly I would welcome your questions or comments at this time. Well, I'll just start at the top. Um, would would a teacher be able to take off the face mask if they are like six feet away from the students and are, you know, doing, you know, if they're talking, doing presentation, whatever, um, and they're socially distanced from the students, you know, with that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work with Linda in, in best answering these questions. Uh, I, I understand your question to be you're in a classroom of 20 or whatever kids, you're at the front of the classroom there and their seats are on the floor, however the situation is you're six, eight, 10, 12, whatever feet away from them, are you required to wear a mask? The recommendation that you see here is they're required to wear a mask unless they're socially distancing themselves. Can they socially distance at 12 feet? Yes, they can, that would be part of the recommendation. So they would not be required to wear a mask in that situation. They are recommending, however, that you wear a mask and it doesn't necessarily take away if you're social distancing, it's still a good idea to wear a mask, is what they're they're saying, um, and it's changing all the time. That yeah, recommendation. They're saying, I mean, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics is. I've really, we've really um, structured a lot of this. It's been the CDC, the Wisconsin Department of of Health, and then the American Academy of Pediatrics has a really nice article on their website that talks about each of these um, topics. And they do talk about, you have to consider a child wearing a mask, is it, do the benefits outweigh the risk? So some of those things are gonna be done on an individual basis. And um, that'll be true with, you know, if you have a staff member who has COPD, and can't wear a mask for extended periods of time, we're gonna to have to you know, work with that person as well. Um, hand washing, I don't feel like we've given hand washing enough kudos. If I had to pick one thing, it would be hand washing over masks and everything else. And I'm a mask wearer, I wear them. This is the largest group I've been in since March, and I'm a little uncomfortable. I mean, even with our social distancing, um, so I'm a mask wearer. I don't go into gas stations. If I fill up my vehicle, I use a barrier like a paper towel. Um, hand washing, number one, if you have to pick anything. Um, so I don't want to negate the masks because I think they're extremely helpful, but they need to be used in conjunction with hand washing and social distancing. Um, we have ordered a lot of personal protective equipment. Um, I have 300 face shields coming that people can use. And again, they say in addition to the masks, but if you're able to, you know, be six, eight, ten feet away from your students, wearing that face shield might be a nice alternative because then they're going to be able to see your face 
and hear you more clearly. We have gowns, disposable gowns coming for people that are gonna be working in the health room. And I have some K95s, which are very similar to N95s that are on order as well. And those we're gonna be able to get there, they came from FEMA. So we're gonna be able to get those. Um, FEMA is also giving us two face masks per student, the cloth masks, and we're getting two um, infrared thermometers also from FEMA. So we'll have probably at least three infrared, infrared thermometers, which are the non-touch in each of our buildings. Any questions for me? Keep telling Sean. How, my, how, will, <laughs> how will like lunchtime work for, I mean, students and staff? I mean, students obviously are eating in the cafeteria. They can't wear a mask right. when they're eating. Staff, right. do, they, do they still get to eat in the staff room or? Well, that's a decision that I guess I don't feel qualified to make, but my suggestion would be we really have to limit the staff to staff interaction. They are finding, again, the American Academy of Pediatrics is they use the word beyond a preponderance of the evidence to suggest that children are asymptomatic for the most part and they're not spreading it to one another or to staff as easily as we assumed. The staff is spreading it to the staff. The adults are spreading it to the adults. So we need to distance ourselves from, from one another as so, well. So based on that information, we would not want our staff lounges open as they were in the past. You're and just it, asking for trouble. And I don't, Dr. Durfel and I have talked about this too, just in passing, they're recommending that you have a different room for children to wait in if they have COVID symptoms. So logistic, you know, I, I don't know what that's gonna look like, but they're highly recommending recommending that those students be separate from other students who would typically be in the health room. So, so to increase safety and health, it's the matter of separating the sick from the well. And then I guess that's pretty common. I mean, that's a, a pretty, you know, you're going to separate. But if, the, if they're saying that kids aren't, are they just saying that asymptomatic kids are not spreading? the virus, but symptomatic kids are still capable? They're just saying that children in general, and again, this is, they just use preponderance of the evidence. They are not seeing the spreading between children or children to adults that they thought they would. And I don't have any numbers that is just coming from the American Academy of Pediatrics with the big push to get back to school in person in the fall. I've read the same documentation mm -hmm. that you're reading. I've read numerous articles, the same in, in the studies coming out of other countries of kids not transmitting it. In fact, they're, I think, a third less likely to transmit that if this is what they've used. So if that's the case, then why are they saying then we need a, a separate room for them to isolate if they're not? Well, just best, you know, infection control. You just don't want to mingle, you know, I guess... None of us here would want our child or our loved one to be in a room with somebody suspected with COVID, no matter what the age. And so then what do we, how does that look for our younger kids who would show up to school, um, get sick through the day, and those COVID symptoms are a whole list mm -hmm. of everything that any tummy flu, yep. allergy, whatever would mimic. Then what do we do for, we can't leave them in a room by themselves, right. so what do we do for those people who have to take care of them? It would be a carry in the high school, it would, you know, it would be wherever in our elementary offices. What do we do for those people then? Well, some districts, Osceola is hiring CNAs to be where the nurse isn't. And again, even if I'm there, if you have a separate room for children who are ill, you really want to have a person in each of those places. Mm -hmm. You don't want your, any children, but especially your really little ones, to be unattended. Right. So 
I don't, I don't know the answer to that. And we have PPE, you said, coming for, mm -hmm. and those would be the instances that we would really want to use that. Yes, for the staff who would be taking care of those children. Right. I mean, just want to know that our staff feels that they're protected and that we weren't not having, and we want to know that our parents want to know that our, their kids aren't going to be left alone if they're showing some symptoms. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be in the We the have point. a lot of PPE on its way. But I have a great relationship with Jake, so. No, Joe, Joe, <laughs> yeah. How great can it be? You don't know his name. He loves spotted cow beer. So okay. I just have to All keep right. bringing him that apparently. So um, I think we're really set with the PPE. Um, and we do have a good supply and it's reasonable. The masks are 41 cents a piece and you can order as little as 50. Um, so that's the cheapest I've found. So is this like, you know, are we gonna provide masks to students when they get to school? Is it come in your own mask? Are we saying you have to have your nose covered? I mean, it's always like, even when you're talking, I see it's often coming down yeah. as you're talking, as your jaw's <laughs> pulling your mask down, you know? I mean, you, you have to. You know, you have to get, make sure it's up over your nose. How does, you know, right. how do we work that out right. as I adjust mine? And not, yeah, not touch them. Um, we will have, I'm sure we will have masks on each of the buses for children that don't have their masks. And I'm also ordering pediatric masks, um, which obviously will fit them better. I think I have 2,500 of them coming on the first shipment. So, and those are pretty easy to get the pediatric ones. And again, they're a, pr a reasonable price. I guess, you know, again, I just am trying to think through this. If we are going, if we're going to require masks or even encourage masks, is it, is it effective if they're not wearing them over their nose, if they're no. only wearing them over their mouth? So yes. do, we, do we need signs or enforcement or how do we say you're not wearing your mask properly, you need to well, I would imagine that's something that'll be reinforced in the classrooms too, especially at the, at the younger grades, just part of their, their morning routine um, that they would continue to teach and, and um, model that behavior. And I think we've done a lot, um, a much better job with the hand washing over the last few years. And, and that's kind of come as a consequence of children with food allergies. That's made us very aware of the importance of, of washing our hands often. Please don't lose sight of the recommendation. Now, again, the recommendation is that staff required to mm -hmm. wear a mask, students on the bus required to wear a mask, and students, it's recommended during the school day. That's the recommendation. Make sure we keep our eyes on that. And that certainly can change, but that's the recommendation you're hearing here tonight. And I guess I don't expect that's going to change, at least from the CDC and the, but who knows? Any other questions? Yeah, it's going to be tricky because you have staff that would like us to require students to wear a mask. You have parents that would like us to not require students to wear a mask. And, you know, we're going to have to make a decision on that somewhere along the line. And, you know, those staff that are working with students, you know, well, and you can see that there's a definite division. Um, if you spend any time at, on Facebook at all, you see that definite division. And you know our kids are hearing that at home as well. So again, it's, that's why we wanted to be careful about the wording of, yes, they're highly recommended. And we'll have two available for each student in the district. Um, but again, I guess that's a work in progress as well. Additional questions for Lene or extra commentary in regards to face masks and face coverings? Because I know that's an item we sort of began with here earlier this evening. Do we have an age where, I think I saw something about, you know, under two or, yeah. you know. Two and under and people with, with breathing issues, people who are exercising, and people who are unconscious, certainly. If they can't take their mask off, you don't want to put one on them at any age. So again, the developmental, we have to consider the developmental level of all our students. 
who may not be able to safely wear a mask. Mm -hmm. So do we, I mean, do we say, you know, certain special education students or do we say, you know, PE class or I don't know, how do we, you know, how do we make all those decisions as far as? Well, in regards to kids with documented need, we could simply write that into their plans. That's easy enough to do. I think it's safe to say that when you're exercising, you're not to wear a mask. So if you're running, for instance, that's a recommendation that they wouldn't do that. That would speak to those two issues. It's gonna be individualized. Like Shar was saying, you know, all of the symptoms, that's what we see kids of all ages in the health room every day. Right. So that's where your, your office staff, them knowing the children, you know, my assessment skills, it's gonna come into play. Um, Cause we would be sending dozens of children home every day on uh, some, of our, some of our higher traffic days. Right. Um, but we're gonna do our best to take those symptoms very seriously and work with Polk County to do what they direct us to do. We as a district need to strongly considering hiring more help for Lene in this area, because there's two pieces. There's the actual day-to-day, -day, your document, as in this kid needs to have such and such, but then there's the tracking, the clerical work of all of that. Lene is not capable of doing that all by herself, so we're gonna have to consider getting some assistance. Other districts are doing just that. It's just the nature of the beast. And um, all of that is documented every time some kid gets comes into the sick room, mm -hmm. all of that, right, has to be mm -hmm documented their symptoms, if yep. they were sent home, what action was taken, all of that, right? Yep, we put it on PowerSchool. It's yeah, written happened. on a log and then... Yeah, that's happened for years. I, I, my years at the high school, when you look at someone's log file, it's interesting, they're a senior and you could see they were sent to the sick room in second grade for such and such, mm -hmm. it's there forever. And that person you would hire to kind of track that would be pretty much clerical work, but it would be very, very important. You know, someone so went home on this day and they have to be home 72 hours without symptoms. You know, uh, when did they come back? That information would be, would be critical to help our county track the cases. Um, no, I would like to speak to a email that I received late this afternoon from an individual who couldn't be here because they have a pre-existing condition that would put them in risk to be in a large group setting such as this. And they wanted to make sure that I brought up to you, we have to be very cognizant of the fact that these kids in school, if they're not wearing masks, that that puts me as a parent in my household at risk because they may bring something home to me. So we have to be very careful about family dynamics in regards to how we're educating them. And this person made reference to, perhaps it's just best for my kids to be at home rather than at school right now. Is that a possibility? Well, absolutely, that's a possibility. But those situations and families exist probably rather frequently. We just don't know who they are unless they let us know. So that's, I, I wanted you to be aware of that. I know it's already on your minds. But that's a reality of the situation, too. Are there any other uh, comments that folks wanted to make in regards to face masks or face coverings, or shall we move on? I, I just I think I wanted to speak to that. Lenny, if you could come back for me um, to that, um, of that, that parent's concern of kids bringing things home. <clears throat> As a board, it's our responsibility, I feel, to do what's best for the majority of the children, the majority of the community, and then it ultimately that decision has to lie on the parents to do what's best for them and their situation and their kids. However, with the information that I've read that Lene has um, transferred here tonight is that um, with children maybe being less likely to transmit that virus, then that risk becomes lower than in that setting with kids coming home and then transmitting it to parents or have it or grandparents or things that would be in um, adults in a situation to take care of them. Is that correct, Lenny? Well, if we had a case, if a child had a positive case, we would then have to go through, and we haven't really firmed that up yet. We would notify 
you know, everybody who we we kind of decided we would notify by building. Well, it is uh, the last slide in the PowerPoint that's school exclusion. So hold that thought in regards okay. to how we're going to proceed okay. on that because that's a Pol Polk County Health piece. They created that, and I think we have a, a pretty decent handle right. on how to process that chart. So we're I think talk I, I, my, I think my comment was though that. Um, that, that person's concern or other concerns that I've heard echoed tonight in public comment that if children are less likely or, or almost unlikely to transmit the well, virus. Less, yeah, less So likely. in that setting that they could be bringing things home from school, that's not as big a concern as that maybe that the interactions that adults would have themselves. That's what the American Academy of Pediatrics is saying, yes. Okay. But remember, people are getting all kinds of information from social media, and they're, they're going to be swayed one way or the other. So whatever we say may not affect their opinion on that at all. I understand. But I, I understand that. I mean, I guess I'm just reiterating that for board decision when we look at the mm -hmm. recommendations that are laid out for us in our plan. And when might a little child become an adult or more of an adult or older student? Is that really high? Is it freshman? Is it sophomore? There again, the Academy of Pediatrics is suggesting that all children above the age of two that can wear a mask, it's recommended that they wear it with, with the understanding that they may not be able to and how, how hard are we going to fight that battle? And we have to weigh the risk versus the benefits. Now, at the middle and high school level, they're, they're making a harder push then for those masks to be worn. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, I suppose the older a child gets, the more likely they are then to be able to, to transmit that. But I'm just assuming that. I didn't read anything about that. I think the information I read was 12 and up. 12? 12 So and would up. that be about your middle school age mm -hmm. then? Any other comments or questions? If not, we'll move on to social distancing. Do you need me for social distancing? Um, I don't think so, okay. but you won't be far away in case we do. Social distancing and people interactions. Uh, here are the items that we have for you. Uh, classrooms are socially distanced. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a moment. No field trips. We're looking at the first semester on that. That gets us into the middle of January. No outside groups at school. Sometimes we have groups that come here from elsewhere. Assemblies are socially distanced. For instance, if Mr. Benson's meeting with the sixth grade, there isn't any reason we couldn't get into the gymnasium and spread them out. That's been done before. Uh, no volunteers at school. That's certainly a, a hardship for the elementary and the intermediate where they have quite a few volunteers. And lastly, no parents in the building. We're trying to limit adult to adult context. So we're trying to reorchestrate what elementary and intermediate drop off and pick up looks like. And they've already begun meeting on that very topic because that's a big change. We want adults in the building, but right now we want to minimize contact where possible. So social distancing in a classroom. I, I don't know that it would be uh, rocket science for all of you to conclude that if you have 20 first graders in one setting, that they're likely not to be socially distanced and if they are not for long, because they're not remaining in their seat from the moment they arrive to the moment they leave. And they're in each other's business, if you will. So it is an unrealistic proposition to say that it's occurring in the same fashion as it's unrealistic to say that they're socially distanced in a chemistry lab. You're working with two or three uh, other folks. You're in one closed setting doing one similar task and you're sharing space and you are not socially distanced any more so than the instructor in that classroom is as they move in and around those lab groups. Those are just two examples of thousands of examples to state that it's not realistic. It is reality that to socially distance the classroom, you'd have to either A, reduce the number of kids or change the geography of the room. And to change the geography of the room, a bit of purging may help, as in getting rid of some stuff, but you still have the walls and you still have the windows and you still got the door and that room is that room. And we, we didn't orchestrate our classrooms to have huge large group spaces where we could spread our kids out six feet 
apart. That's not what we designed any of these buildings for. But that's the situation we're presently in. So if we're opening school for a five-day school week and we're recommending masks, we're putting kids in close quarters and we're putting staff amongst them, that's a reality of the recommendation here this evening. And I'm here to say, yes, that could potentially be less safe. That's a reality. So that's my preference to any comments that you may have in regards to social distancing. And your comments are certainly welcome at this time. It's a tough deal. Recess. Excuse me? Recess. Recess. For that's young kids, playground equipment, that kind of stuff. Is that going to be allowed? Is that? Well, we've already begun our pseudo experiment on that with Clubhouse. We've got three different groups of kids and we've been able to navigate that. Though, yes, it's smaller in number than, say, the elementary in full throttle. We're able to use those spaces and use them pretty safely. Um, Cheryl has met with her leadership team, or Elise meeting with her leadership team in regards to how we do recess and breaks in the middle school and the high school. Um, to socially distance the playground is tough because they're going to be playing in and amongst each other on similar equipment. So we have to come up with a way to socially distance them to the best of our ability. Will we be successful and perfect on that? I'm here to tell you absolutely we will not. It's not what school is. Other questions or comments? Well, one thing I had thought about a little bit too is, you know, here in the upper grades and that, the use of lockers. I mean, they're all stacked right next to each other and do you even allow them to have a locker? Well, we've talked about that, and I know that Mr. Gould has uh, specific feelings about the locker use, and Mr. Benson probably does as well. If the truth be told, they're using them less and less frequently, so much so that when we clean their lockers out, none of them know their combinations. They're all um, making sure that our chiropractors 15 and 20 years from now are going to be in business because they're all carrying everything with them in their backpack. Yep. They don't use their lockers, and some of them don't wear coats, so they don't ever go to their locker even to do that. Is that a safe? I hear, I see a head shake from Mr. Gould. Yeah. Mr. Benson's probably of sort of the same mindset. I'm not sure if either of you wanted to speak to locker use. You certainly can come up and do that if you'd like. Well, go ahead. They are assigned a locker. That is true. Whether they use it or not is. I can just say that all students are assigned a locker. We've done our best to separate them as much as we could so that they're not all on top of each other, but that's um, impossible that for everyone that they're not going to be close there. Um, our students right now um, obviously go over there in the morning, put their locker and their things away. Um, I would say we're 50. We're, our kids actually use the lockers probably more than the high school does, but um, we would do our best to um, spread them out as much as we could. Um, as far as transitioning from class to class, but um, so that's kind of what I, where we're at right now. We were planning on moving forward with lockers, but yeah, that's where the mask would be more helpful. Yeah. And then there's FIAD lockers too. Yeah, our lockers though are all over the building in the middle school. They're not like when you come to the here where they're all in one location. Ours yeah. are down the halls, all over where, um, just whatever location, and so. Um, we're able to spread them out a little bit better than some. Mm -hmm. I can say with my years at the high school locker cleanout, there were always a few students that found some surprises in their lockers that were left there from October, and those were always interesting moments. And the, the locker room lockers is also an interesting experience if you have that pleasure. It's quite an interesting environment. Other questions about social distancing or any other items that are on this page? Go ahead, come on up. So with social distancing at the elementary and intermediate school, they're really talking about keeping your students in cohorts, and that's easy to do at the elementary and intermediate. Um, not completely 100% easy because we do some switching for intervention time, but the more you can keep your kids together in their cohort, so in their classroom, when they attend specials, if they attend specials or do the specials come to them, the specialists come to them, 
um, in the cafeteria, they'll eat by cohort, in for recess, they'll go out by cohort. I'm going to echo what um, Mrs. Seaman said about hand washing. Recess is part of the child's learning day at the elementary and intermediate school. It's part of their curriculum. A lot happens at recess, very um, engaging, socially um, interactive. Um, so that we need to have recess and we can't clean every piece of playground equipment. I don't believe that's happening right now. Nina, correct, with Clubhouse. So it's gonna be very, very important that we teach kids, that we teach, model, practice, teach, model, practice, that's gonna be the routine, and that they learn that when they come in from recess, that's an automatic, you wash your hands. Um, and, and that's the way that we're gonna deal with recess and dealing with the school day and social distancing is keeping our students in their cohort. And I would imagine, um, Cheryl, that that would be built into their day with their teachers, right? Is frequent bathroom breaks to Absolutely. wash their hands. Yes. And as stated earlier, there will be hand sanitizer um, available also, but we do want them to use the, um, the restrooms as often as possible to wash right. their hands, and they'll be taught how to wash their hands. We also have gone so far as to create a, um, we have, we, all the buildings have with PBIS the Warrior Way, and um, there are posters that show kids how to um, be responsible, res be respectful, and be safe. And it gives examples for every environment that they're in, whether they're on the playground, in the hallway, in the cafeteria. And we have already started designing the COVID-19 Warrior Way poster on being respectful, being responsible, be safe. And it includes things about um, how to sneeze. You sneeze into your elbow, how to wash your hands. Um, so that's all built into the poster. So it's, you know, it's taking a lot of preparation to get our things in order so that we can do the best we can do to keep our students and our staff, our staff very safe. And I have to go on record to say, if we don't have healthy staff, we don't have school. And because we don't have people out there just wanting to sub. And I, I'm going to echo the sentiments that our staff has shared with you. They are fearful. COVID is fearful. And it does create fear. And I think anything we can do to ease the fear of our staff and to keep our staff healthy, because if they have to be excluded from school, that is an issue that the administrative team is already talking about. We don't have bodies to pull out of a hat to keep school going. And there's not a person in this room that doesn't want to keep school going. We know it's best for the mental health, the academic health, the social emotional health of our children to be in school. And we can do that by keeping people safe and healthy. Thank you. Any questions? And that's a nice segue into our, our, our next slide. The mental health of students and the mental health of staff is very much at the forefront of what we do. Certainly their academic health matters, but we've had kids that have been absent from us now when they get to the fall, a better part of five, six months. That's gonna have an impact. In some cases, they've had family dynamics where they've had a lot of time to themselves, perhaps a lot of screen time. We've lost academic time. There's a lot of factors that are, are involved there. So we're gonna have to keep our eyes open as to what damage has been done, because there is damage that's been done. And we're gonna have to come up with ways to remediate to get those folks back to where they need to be. Because if you're not socially and emotionally well, you're probably not gonna be academically well. And we have to make sure that we target the needs of those kids. But in addition to that, if you're not socially and emotionally well, you're not gonna be on your game as an instructor either. And we wanna make sure that we're attending to that as well, because this has had a huge impact for all of us to be away from our kids for this length of time. It's in many cases the lifeblood of what these people do each and every day. And it's been stripped away from them at a moment's notice and it's been gone for the better part of a half a year. That's tough stuff. So that's gonna be at the forefront of our efforts. The can Last, I, can, go ahead, oh, sorry. Can I just, ba a little backing up one, um, I guess I'm kind of wondering, you know, how, I'm sure you just have to make modifications, but you know, some of the, some of the buildings, especially the elementary and intermediate, rely heavily on volunteers and parents coming in to help at school yes. with, you know, with testing or reading or, mm -hmm. you know, various things. 
I guess I'm just wondering, you know, and, and the same thing, it really makes me sad to think that there will be no field trips. You know, I, I, I don't know if teachers can do more kind of special activities instead of a field trip if they can, you know, I don't know, something, but it's just, and I understand that it's the situation we are in, but it's very sad. It's very sad. We're not going to fill the gap of a high quality field trip, and there are numerous examples of those. We're going to seek out virtual trips where possible. And we're hopeful that this passes in a, in a soon enough fashion where we'll be able to get back on the road to go to the places that we've always gone to. Again, and even just getting outside and yes. the groups that go to WAPO or go to, you exactly. know. You know. You're not going to fill that gap with any kind of creation in-house. It's not the same. Or virtually. It's not, or virtually. It's not the same to go to the, to go to the aquarium and to do a virtual of the aquarium is a two, two totally different things. The last topic of the evening, in essence, is the school exclusion tree, and this is for students and staff. The, exclu the school exclusion chart that you see on the very last page is a creation of Polk County Health. Now, please know that this is applicable to both students and staff. That's straight from Polk County Health. I explicitly asked that question. So there are a variety of symptoms you see there at the top of the page, and you're probably thinking, holy cow. That's a lot of kids right off the bat. Yes, it is. Please note the asterisk that you see there. These symptoms should be outside the student's baseline. So if they're a seasonal allergy kid and they have a variety of these symptoms that they've had every single year they've been a kid, we can rest assured that it's probably part of the normal behavior. But in some cases, it won't be. If that's the case, then we're going to have a kid that's symptomatic potentially. So the answer is yes. If, you, if you're following the chart, you move to the left, then you send that student home and request a COVID test. Then the next step in the process, was that test done? Yes. Was that test done? No. You follow the chart in that way. If the test is done and it's a yes, it's a follow-up from Polk County Health and that's a school exclusion situation. If in fact they did the test and they're negative, you exclude the student or staff person for 24 hours until they're symptom free without medication use. And there isn't anything further to do there. Now where it gets tricky is on the right side of the page. They did not have these symptoms, but yet they were in close contact with someone who did. And we've had a couple of situations like this already over the course of the summer. So you were in close contact with a person who was positive, the answer is yes, so you move towards the middle of the page. If notified by Polk County Health, exclude 14 days past the last exposure. So if you were in contact with someone that was positive this past Wednesday, you are quarantined for 14 days from that Wednesday forward. That's a Polk County Health decision. That is a daunting undertaking to keep track of all of that. And it could very well be the case that you have multiple situations ongoing at the same time. Polk County is managing not just Amory, but eight other districts. So they have task force that they're creating for each district because they full well realize that this could be, you know, 17 cases in a week that are ongoing and they're going to have to track that and have to decide who stays and who goes. This does not mean if you have a teacher that is positive that you automatically have every kid excluded in the classroom. Could you? You certainly could, but that does not automatically mean that. And further, it doesn't mean if you have a kid in the classroom that's positive that you automatically exclude everyone there in the classroom. That's a Polk County Health decision. And it also doesn't mean that those things couldn't occur. You could have entire classrooms. You could have entire areas of buildings. For instance, three instructors in a similar area all be gone at the same time. Now, you, we all have to deal in reality. If we have X percentage of kids gone or X percentage of staff gone, at some point it could be unmanageable to do our work. But we don't know what that's going to look like. We won't know that until we get into the fall. So this is the school exclusion tree as authored by Polk County Health. And I'm sure there may be questions about it. This, thankfully, is one page as opposed to the DPI version, which was seven pages. So that's at least helpful. So um, when we talk about sending kids home, and then obviously you can only recommend that they get a COVID test. You can't require that. Correct. Um, they're 
so many reasons why you can't require that. But um, if they did get a COVID test and they tested negative, that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have the virus. I'm not a health professional, so I wouldn't be able to best respond to that. So can Lene maybe come up and help us with this? So perhaps restate your question if you could. Okay, so if they, um, anybody, an adult or a child would have symptoms and they get uh, a COVID test and they test negative, which is possible to still have COVID and test negative because they're not shedding the virus yet. So, I mean, yes, it would so depend. Then what do we do just because they have a negative test? Do we have a requirement that says then X number of days later, yes. they need to have another test? Um, three days symptom free is what the exclusion is saying. So anything beyond this would probably come to us from public health. And again, that's why that tracking will be so important. Um, and I'm sure that anybody that I send home for or that we send home for a while will be running by public health just to till we get a feel for their tolerance and their preference and what they want us to do. But they could be symptom free mm -hmm. and then they or feel better within 72 hours, which is often the case of COVID that it waxes and wanes and we find that that real traumatic effect on their bodies doesn't happen until about seven days in after they've initially felt symptoms. So if they feel better within 72 hours, they've had a negative COVID test. Um, they come back to school and then the next week they feel crummy again, they go, they leave again, then they could test positive. How do we make that differentiation? How long, how? If they test positive, then there's, the algorithm has a different scenario and that's where public health will follow up. So again, we'll follow their direction. This is not gonna be our call. It's gonna be Polk County Health's call the communication efforts and tracking and letting folks know where we stand is gonna be our call in association with them, but we're not gonna play doctor on this end in regards to who's excluded, staff or student. I maybe just, didn't answer you, but I don't know that I would have the question to that. I, I guess I'm just wondering if there's suggestions for follow-up testing, even um, do they, I, I just think, I guess I've known people that have Initially, they've come into contact, close contact, family member, a husband, a spouse, um, who's tested positive. They initially tested negative, their children tested negative, and then a week later, they've tested positive. Um, it's anybody's that's guess why, how long? Well, we're quarant that's why a lot of people will be quarantined for the 14 days, and sometimes there is such a, a possibility that somebody can be negative and be out of school or work longer than if they were positive. Yes. So um, there are those scenarios also. Or if they weren't tested, then they're out for 14 days. Okay, so that, answer, okay, so that answers the, my question to them that leads into the next part of my question. How are we um, responsible for absenteeing those kids from school? What are our requirements there? You said absent absences? Yep, okay. if they're absences, what are we doing for that? Yes, we met as a administrative team in addition to that, our attendance takers, if you will, at each building. And we have established two new attendance codes. Your traditional codes have been a PAR, I'll just make up examples. You went to Hawaii, you're on family vacation, it's parent excused, you're on your way, have a good time, you're back, you use your days. The second code has typically been an EXC, which means you're going, you're sick, you went to the doctor, you brought a doctor's note, you were at the doctor, it doesn't count against you. The two new codes are COV, which not surprisingly stands for COVID, and the person would be coded as COVID. It doesn't count against your parent excuse days, and it certainly doesn't count as a doctor's note, it's COVID for a reason. We wanna track the number of absences, how many have been gone, how often they have been gone, and how long they've been gone, because we want to document to Polk County Health and Department of Health Services, here's our situation, this is what our attendance portfolio looks like. 
If we don't track COVID, we would never know. And then lastly, an SIC code, which is the kid was sick, they don't have a doctor's note, they didn't have COVID, they were just sick. And that doesn't count against your parent excuse days and it certainly doesn't count as a doctor's note because that's not what you did. But at the end of the day, the district is gonna take a very flexible approach to attendance and we are only gonna send kids to the doctor that need to be sent to the doctor because the hospital doesn't want extra traffic. They want just those who need to be there. So we're tracking attendance in that way. And since you asked, I'd like to talk to you about how we're tracking staff attendance as well. We have established in IRMA, which is our attendance taking measures for staff. We're tracking COVID related absences there as well, because we want to document our needs with staff. We've had X staff gone for X times for X period of time. This is our portfolio with staff attendance. So we're tracking it differently for both groups. And we're gonna do it in a flexible way because this is a time that flexibility is needed. And so um, you wouldn't be necessarily coding for student absences COVID unless they had come into contact with or we would had a positive want to, test themselves or? We would want it known to be that it was a COVID related reason. They had it or a family member had it and that's why they weren't there. So we can document who was gone and how often and how, how much that made up our attendance portfolio. Okay. And without coding it that way, it would all look like sick and it would all be blended in together, which is not an accurate picture. And then, so what if they went to the, what if they went to the doctor, they were sick, um, their COVID test was negative, but they were still remained sick for 14, 22 days. I don't, I had a daughter who was extremely sick for 22 days. They wouldn't test her for COVID. Um, obviously we were out of school, thankfully at the time, but they wouldn't test her. They absolutely refused twice to, to test her. So do, do we need an actual written doctor's well, we're not gonna, we don't wanna get into a guessing game as to what the absence was. We're only gonna code COV stuff that we know is COVID. We, we don't wanna guess that it was COVID when we don't know that it was. But there would be leniency on the absentee policy in relation if that wasn't. Ultimately what the absentee policy is gonna boil down to is if once you've used five days, you'll get a letter stating you've used five days. Once you've used 10 days, we'll let you know that you've used 10 days, a parent excuse. And then lastly, if you're chronically absent, the building principal is going to call you and say, your kid's chronically gone. we got to figure out a plan here. But uh, are we going to be punitive? No way. Not with what's happening. We're going to be very flexible. Okay. So is my understanding then that if they are in close contact with someone, they find out later on that that person tested positive, that it's going to be up to the Polk County Health as to whether or not they need to be out of school? Correct and whether they go into quarantine. That's an actual real example that happened this last week. A student came in close contact. They're one of our weight room kids. They came in close contact with someone outside of the district and they've been in quarantine uh, since the Thursday of this, this past week. And that was like because Polk County Health told them Correct. to? Correct. And the school gets notified in that situation that the, that school the student isn't allowed or the adult isn't allowed Right. In school, that they're right. self-quarantining. In this case, we notified them and Polk County did. But that won't pass. So say a student comes in and, you know, says, I just found out that I was with my uncle last Saturday and I just found out he tested positive. Now it's Thursday. So that Polk County Health will determine whether or not that student needs to go into quarantine. Correct. But probably they will. I can't say Either probably. I'm Polk simply County. going to say that Polk County is going to make that but determination. But the people that that student has been with all week, that won't pass on to them as well. No, here's a real life example. If you, uh, if you came in contact with someone who was known to be positive for COVID, you would need to go into quarantine. But if you are an associate, a friend of, a family, per, family member of, a student of the person that came in contact with the other person, you do not necessarily go into quarantine and likely you wouldn't just if you came directly in contact. Okay. But a lot of times you don't find out until True. You know, a week after you were in contact with them. True. Then you find out that his Which is the top. deadliness of this the way that this spreads, but also the the uh, complication of tracking it, which is why we're gonna need more help for Lene to be able to track it. Okay. 
we would also start gathering co potential contacts so that when we call Polk County, you know, we would do our best to have some, some probable contacts for them. Yeah. I mean, and I've also heard concern about all of that tracking and about privacy and about, you know, Polk True. County yeah. collecting all of this information. Right. Well, it's a necessity to collect it, but the manner in which you impart it, say for instance, you have a second grader to make up a grade that was tested positive for COVID or a second grade instructor, you cannot by law message out that a second grade teacher at Amory Elementary School tested positive for COVID. You cannot message it in the way that would identify who the person is you could go as far down as building level and no further. You could say there is a positive case of COVID at the elementary school. That's as far as you can go, because that doesn't identify the person. It could be a student or a staff person, and that narrows it down to 400 people as opposed to 75. That's the law. And keeping in mind that 40% of the, the COVID cases are asymptomatic. So what we can say is there's a confirmed positive case. I think we'd be able to assume that there are going to be positive cases that aren't identified. That's why the masks and the hand washing and social distancing. Other questions about the school exclusion tree? I don't, you know, I, I, mean, I understand that you don't want to be too specific, but I also, then you have 400 students and their families who think, well, it could be in my class, you know, kind of like what with the Osceola Correct. destination imagination, everyone said, Correct. could have been in my room. I don't know if it was in my room or not, you know? And so a lot of people were kind of like, do I quarantine? I don't know if I was exposed or not. And I, and I can't give you a better answer than we're always going to follow the law. We can't do it any further right. down than that. That's the law. So that's what we'll do. It just causes a lot of ripples then. It does. Everyone being. It does. Other questions or comments about the school exclusion tree? <coughs> does Polk County Health have the staff to do all this? That's a, very, this? that's a very important question. I don't know them intimately well enough to know the answer to that question. I can only share with you what they've shared with us. They've been very helpful. Uh, they have been air, very much on task in providing assistance. We are thankfully in a county where that's occurred. Some counties, they've been absent from the picture. Um, right now, I'd say yes. But if you get 17 and then 37 and then 57 cases in a particular county, eventually that becomes unsustainable for them. So yes, right now, but I can't speak to their personnel. They know that this problem is not going to get smaller. It's only going to be the same or bigger for a while. Especially since when school starts and schools are going to have to start reporting Correct. to them. Right now, they're not hearing from you. But come September 1st, all the schools in the district. I imagine are they've got to be getting prepared and then some as we speak. Yeah. That would be my hunch. I guess, yeah, I guess my concern is which has nothing to do with this, but my concern is availability of tests if we're, if we're going back to school and there's going to be panic and, um, you know, if we're going to recommend kids get tests because they're sick and then the parents are going to, you know, have questions themselves because their kids are sick and they're going to be running and getting tests and I know that they're in some cases already Minnesota faces this issue already that people are coming in like every other day and getting tested just out of fear um and you know they they wanted to bolster their numbers of course everybody would like to test but we have to remember it's a snapshot in time sure i imagine our health care providers are as nervous as anybody about that once school starts because that upticks for them i just think of the volume of of regular influenza tests and strep tests that the hospitals perform when school right. comes back into session. And of course, we have to have remember that every year that school comes back into session, it's new germs because sure. kids haven't been around each other. And there's always that influx of always. sickness right away at the beginning of the year after three, four weeks together. And then, and then to add this on top of it, I have, it's, it's gonna be an issue. 
it will be very tough. So the timeline moving forward, so folks are well aware of that, we have a regularly scheduled July board meeting next Monday, July 20th. You would be asked, because again, we're not taking any action on any of this here this evening, you would be asked to take action on that next Monday. What you have before you is what you'll see next Monday, unless I'm given the task of changing something in particular. If you have something of that sort, it would probably be best to impart that here. And now the only to-do list item that I have is to inquire with staff as to what their thoughts are about coming back in the fall and what that problem looks like. And I will certainly do that here as soon as tomorrow. Um, but other than that, the recommendation as you see it set forth is what you would see next Monday. You could either take action or table it and do it at a later time. The only thing that I would caution you is eventually we run out of time and we got to get ready to start school on September 1st and we only have six weeks to do that from July 20th. Um, I will come to you in August as I shared with you earlier with policy in regards to staff absences and how we would process that. Um, I don't have that written and I'm sure you're not surprised by that <laughs> because that's an ever changing topic. So. If there's anything else, this is certainly be the time. If not, I will turn it back over to Chelsea and she can wrap us up or if you have thoughts or comments, okay. now would certainly be the time. Well, I guess, you know, I don't know if we want to discuss changing the recommendation that students are recommend, that it's recommended that students wear masks. I don't know if we, you know, I, I really don't know um, if we require students to wear masks, if we require middle school and high school students to wear masks, unless there is a health concern or, you know, they don't have the ability to put it on or take it off themselves or, I, I don't, I guess that's probably my biggest question is if we change that at all or if we keep it as recommendation. My, my thought is if it is a recommendation, you might have half of the students wearing masks. I mean, that's my gut feeling. And so I don't know if, if that is effective then or how effective that is if only half of the students are participating. Um, I've thought a lot about mask versus no mask. Um, I listened to the community comments that we had tonight. Um, most of them, which were our teachers and our own staff which is always a concern, a forethought of mine when I make decisions um, and, and cast a vote in this board. And it's, it's very difficult for me to, to look at the staff that were here tonight um, imploring us to require our children to wear masks and say, that's difficult. In that same breath, that's difficult. It's, it's difficult um, for just a logistic factor of um, kids forgetting their masks, kids not um, bringing their masks, parents having pushback of my kid isn't going to wear a mask, then that um, core value, that sentiment boils down to your children. Um, you end up with children already having social problems at school being picked on, being um, bullied, and then, um, then you end up with a mask debate. You know, my mask is better than your mask, or we're sharing masks, or then I look around, the, I looked around tonight, and I, I intentionally watched um, people with their masks on here, and we're only sitting here for a few hours, and we're adults. Um, me, personally, I have a reason that I choose not to wear a mask most of the time. I did here tonight. It was a, a recommendation. It was a requirement here. I did tonight. Um, kids, adults who are survivors of trauma, emotional abuse, physical abuse, have a, a hard time with this. We have kids who are um, under special requirements, um, our kids with autism, Asperger's, who couldn't possibly stand the thought of having a mask on their face. And if it comes down to a district having to make that decision of who gets to not wear a mask versus who has to wear a mask, that is a really dangerous slope to put our teachers in, our administrators in, and our leaders in. 
Um, and then just, you know, just requiring the mask itself um, in cer certain settings. We're sitting here as adults and we're touching our masks, we're adjusting our masks. Um, uh, in fact, Erin pointed it out with Cheryl at the podium, um, her mask coming down while she's talking and, and she's grabbing it and I've been grabbing mine and then I'm touching things and I've watched people in the audience themselves tonight grabbing their mask, touching their mask and then touching other surfaces too. Um, so those things, all I think recommending a mask is a wonderful thing to say, even some is better than none, but to require it, I think we put people in a really bad spot. And that would be my thought of masks. I, I guess I just have a little comment as to that. I mean, I just wanna point out, and I'm not sure if this is really emphasized enough, but on slide number 23, um, and we mentioned this at the last board meeting that all school districts in Polk County are moving forward with the exact same guidelines that are being recommended. This isn't just Amory, this is Clayton, Clear Lake, Frederick, Luck, Osceola, where everybody's on the same page with this recommendation. So if, if we're not all on board, then... There's only two is. exceptions to that that I'm aware of. There's one school in Polk County that's looking at a four day week and one school in Polk County that's looking at a mass requirement for kids from grades five through 12. Other than that, everyone is doing exactly what you see listed here across the board. Well, ultimately it, it comes down to the risk factor. You know, as, the, as the one parent staff said that too is, is so we recommend it, we hope you wear it because when it arrives, that could change the face of school immediately like we saw it. And now you're at home. Whereas wearing the mask can alleviate <coughs> some of that risk and reduce it. So, you know, I, I don't wanna force people to wear, wear a mask, but I think for the most part, people are smart enough to understand, we all did here that Wearing the mask is something that is going to help reduce the risk. And so maybe that's what we got to look at more yeah. is, is making sure that obviously staff and community want the school open five days a week face to face. Well, there's, there's some stuff that has to go along with that. The hand sanitizer, the social distancing, maybe wearing the mask. Um, it's, it's, it's not a force issue, but it's just a, a uh, humanitarian issue. Uh, and, and it could be a force issue down the road if there is an outbreak. I mean, it's not like we can't change policy in two months from now, you know? This whole I thing mean, is subject to change right. based on where yeah. this goes. This All is these not rules set are in stone. To, to, yeah. I mean, the governor's constant, the mayor's, everybody's constantly changing the rules. They have different directives every week. So and we have it's not the, like this is written in stone. <laughs> like, sorry to like interrupt. Pencil. And we have from the <laughs> beginning followed the directions of health care providers. And second, we followed every order that was given to us, whether it be from the governor or whoever. I mean, if there was a county or a city ordinance, we would follow that too. So Keith, I think you had a good point that our ultimate goal is that we all want to be back in school five days a week. And, and I understand it's not may be possible for all people to wear a mask all the time, but um, it's certainly a humanitarian thing to do and a, a way of helping. Um, it's not gonna eliminate COVID, but it can help reduce the risk and help hopefully keep us open five days a week would be my opinion. Um, I know Cheryl, you made the comment that, uh, you know, without a healthy staff, we're not gonna be here. So, you know, we have to, uh, I think try and do everything we can to, I mean, we wanna keep all our students and staff healthy, but if we don't have a healthy staff, we're all gonna be home. So uh, that's kind of a, would be a, in my mind a priority to help do what we can to keep our staff healthy. Um, and and the a comment was made, if it's an error that we're uh, wearing a mask, well, then we erred on the side of caution. Um, you know, maybe we wore a mask for a few months and nobody got hurt. So, I don't know, my, my comments, I guess, but. Yeah, I, I, Dale, I agree with you 100% to say, you know, it's a, 
and Keith, again, it's a humanitarian thing to do. Um, and I think, <laughs> unfortunately, it's gotten to be politicized, and it, sh it shouldn't be. But I, I, have a, I take a real strong exception with somebody saying that because you choose not to wear a mask or you can't wear a mask or there's reasons that you can't wear a mask, that you're not being humanitarian. And I have been called myself selfish for not wearing a mask. There's reasons that I don't. And I can sit here, I can tell you right now that these last three hours have been excruciating for me to wear this mask. I am a trauma survivor. Um, most people know that. Um, what this does to me is terrible. Um, but it is no way makes me selfish that I choose not to wear a mask or that I am not humanitarian because I, um, I feel that that's a real broad statement to make for people who can't wear a mask any more than anybody can help it if they have Asperger's or autism or anything like that. But without an IEP, then we have people who are in the school, kids who are in the school that are trauma survivors who may have a real hard time with that, who don't have an IEP and then you get to pick and choose, and I think that puts our staff in a really bad sh shape, too. I think Lene had a good point of saying that, our, that kids have a lower risk of transmittal, and that really that social distancing and the mask wearing among adults is probably going to keep our staff healthier, and requiring it with our staff would help keep them healthier than requiring our kids to. And I just, I think that we have to really be mindful of the trauma that we could impact with those kids. And they may not be able to be here physically. And those kids are some of the most, they require it sometimes the most to be here. Um, and to, so to require it to students, I think is just, it's asking a lot. And, and I didn't run down that road of, of requiring. I'm just saying if, if we want this to work, um, everybody's gonna have to give a little. And, and situations like that, I do understand um, I think as a whole, you know, parents and guardians and, and us, we want to do the best we can, so we want to err by, if you can, if you're able, wear a mask. I mean, it, it's... And I think that's in the language, right? That it's yeah. recommended. Yeah. Requiring is another level. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think if parents understand and students understand that, you know, um, obviously the risk that they're if they're taking outside here, can close this. And, and then it cause virtual learning again or some other some form of yeah. it, yeah. And I think you're right, Keith, too. I mean, we talk about what goes on in our building and that's the only thing that we really do have control over. <clears throat> um, but watching kids and it, you know, I think everybody did a great job on that lockdown when we were, when we were locked down, I, you know, I would go, personally myself, I would only go out grocery shopping once yeah. a week or any, more no more than I had to for sure and parents weren't bringing their kids to the stores and there was just one person per you know family or whatever and then all of a sudden we can see that you know as things are opening up we see kids hanging out at Walmart we see kids you know congregating in places we see adults congregating in places and and things like that too and so that also it brings that risk in where Dale I can understand what you're saying you know that because of those outside influences it's to keep our staff safe, um, you know, but then in our own state, we're asking our own staff too and requiring a mask here. Um, and then again, if we're asking our kids to wear a mask, then even their own lives outside of school has to be a factor themselves of their level of risk. So, um, and you know, I, I know that there are staff that go and hang out together, or, you know, in, in public settings and things like that. And so, I think we just have to be mindful of what's best for the kids and also to try to keep the staff here and keep our doors open for sure. But it's a tough situation. But yeah. I think if we recommend it, and I, you know, I, I've been to stores, I've been to um, some gatherings and I've seen that kids that are able to, they do, the young people do a really good job of putting on those masks. Yeah. You know, so if they're asked, you know, that it's, yeah. it's Recommended. They're probably a lot better than we give them credit for. I think so too. In fact, I actually saw a whole group of young people. They were in their 20s, probably coming into Walmart the other night. And I was um, driving out, and they were all—they'd all gotten out of their car, and they were all putting on masks as they were heading into to Walmart. And I think I think those kids are—we've done a good job raising responsible citizens and raising responsible kids for the most part. And if you ask, 
and say, boy, we really recommend this and we want to keep our staff, I think they're responsible too. Yeah. And I, well, but to require is a whole other thing. You teach, model, and practice, right? <laughs> right. So <laughs> you wear it, you show the kids as, as parents and as, as staff that this is just what we do. And, and hopefully, you know, not so much in the elementary grades, but in the upper grades, they just decide that that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think if they can, I think that's wonderful. I think they will. If they yeah. can't and it's, there are outsiding forces, I think it, it's a big ask to say you have to. Yeah. It's going to be another um, hot, top, hot button topic, though, even amongst kids that, you know, why are you yep. wearing a mask? Why aren't you wearing a mask? Yep. This is what my family thinks. This is what my family I mean, you're going to have some of that. And so, again, yep. Just as adults have to have grace with each other, the kids are going to have to, and we're going to have to help with that because there are families that are very strongly against them and very, families that are very Absolutely. strongly for them, and you're going to have that conflict coming into the yes. school as well. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to conclude by saying a couple of things real quick. I want to thank the 75-ish, now about a dozen-ish of you hearty souls who have stuck with us for three-plus hours. Thank you for taking an interest in what we do in the School District of Amory, because it certainly matters. It is, after all, your kids we're talking about here. I want to thank the members of the district team for their contributions before, during, and guaranteed after this meeting has concluded. Thank the board members for their thoughtful considerations here this evening. And then, to let folks know our path forward. And I sort of alluded to that earlier, but I'd like to share with you, I'm gonna send out an update to those who couldn't be here tonight. We'll send out an email stating, here's where you can find the recording, here's where the presentation is, and also to let them know that Polk County is seeking to be on the same page. And then lastly, let them know, what I'm letting all of you know here and now, that next week, Monday, at our regular meeting, we're gonna go ahead and vote, approve, move forward with the recommendations you see here, unless there are other considerations that come up between now and then or something changes on that evening. And then to message out the plan in its fullest, not just the recommendations, but what are we gonna do for recess? What are you going to do with transportation? All of that by the end of July, early August, and then be in position to start our school year on the 1st of September. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Chelsea and she can wrap us up. All right, um, yes, I would once again like to thank the leadership team, which I'm sure spent hours and hours putting together this, um, this bounce back plan um, and also the community comments uh, tonight and the parents and staff who completed the survey. And with that, um, this meeting's adjourned.